All right, good morning, everybody. This is Stephen Clark, chair of LTAC. Uh, can you hear us in Southern California? Yes, we can. Awesome, awesome. So uh, uh, just a quick uh, little tweak to the agenda, uh, and, because I do want to discuss the subject matter. We're going to go ahead and do the call to order and roll call so we can officially start the meeting. Um, prior to delving into the ELAP presentation, I just want to have a discussion about uh, public comment. Because um, you note on the agenda, there isn't a, a general open public comment uh, for, for non-agenda items for this meeting, since this was a special uh, meeting that was called. And I also want to discuss a further tweaking or slight adjustment for, that I'm proposing for how to, uh, where to fit public comment in so that we can continue to move through this agenda item and other future agenda items. Uh, but I'm just one LTAC member, and so I'd like to make sure we're close to somewhat of a consensus or agreement on that. Also have heard some direct and indirect feedback from some other LTAC, member, LTAC members in terms of we need, we need some further refinement of, of the public comment. So process. So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, Jacob, I'm assuming, will you do roll call or would you like me to? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you're speaking <laughs> to use the microphone, so <laughs> that does not happen. <laughs> <laughs> and then at least here in the room here, the microphones are on when the green light is on. Okay, we'll begin with the roll call. Diane Anderson. Mindy, Mindy Boley. Here. Jill Broat. Gail Cho. Here. Stephen Clark. Here. Ronald Koss. Is Ron Koss present down in Southern California? No, he isn't. Hugh Doy. Hugh Doe. Here. Andy Eden. Here. Miriam Gabor. Here. Bruce Godfrey. Anthony Gonzalez. Oh, actually, if we can, if we can back up, Bruce uh, was intending to have a proxy. It was for, it was done through the timeline of our uh, bylaws, and so there, there may be a Brad Meadows in Southern California. Yes, I'm here. Thanks, Brad. Anthony Gonzalez. Rich Gossett. Here. David Kimbrough. Here. Mark Kokomore. Here. Bruce LaBelle. Here. Allison McKenzie. Here. Sean McCarthy. Here. Christine Satello. Here. Renee Spears. Here. Okay, excellent. And uh, in Southern California, if, uh, let me see, if Ron does uh, arrive, uh, please let us know. Um, and we'll do the same if, if Jill is able to make the meeting in Northern California. <clears throat> okay. So again, you know, we've 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 seen over the over the course of our LTAC meetings um, the the uh, need for us to engage with the public, a public's desire to engage with us, and so I want to talk about quickly two items. One is um, kind of how I've been proposing to address public comments in general. And uh, so for all of our meetings that are just general meetings where we're not calling a special meeting for a particular subject matter, and this is the first one we've done so, we've had a public comment period at the beginning of the meeting. And at the last meeting, what we did is targeted a three-minute presentation uh, for those that might be representing you know, very large groups. We, we entertained extending it to five minutes, and then we were bucketing, as I call it, the uh, subject matter, if it was a complaint, it goes through the formal complaint process. If it was something that for us as LTAC members, it needs to go to one of our work groups, we direct it to the work group. So listen to the public, engage the subject matter and define where it needs to go. So uh, I wanna make sure, cause I did again hear through the grapevine and directly from some, uh, uh, some level of satisfaction or dissatisfaction on how we were handling public comments. So in regards to that, that upfront public comment framework uh, is, is there anybody that has a different proposal on how to handle that? Because we can engage that. Okay. And so again, for today's meeting, since this was a special meeting called for a specific subject matter, we wanted to channel our public comments toward that subject matter and not have other public comments f come forward because we, we need to get through this agenda item today. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, 
in regards to uh, how the agenda was handled today. As you recall back in the, when we started uh, this, we had just public comments at the beginning and then for the whole meeting, and then we took public comments and put them up front before we discussed the items. And then at the last meeting, we had the public comments at the end after we discussed the items, and that spurred more dialogue. So what I'm proposing moving forward is that uh, we hear on a presentation subject matter, like for example, today we have the ELAP presentation and the presentation by uh, Amber and or Bill and or Steve, I'm not sure who's giving it, um, at 1035, and then have public comment about the, the, the agenda items so that we can hear anybody else's opinions or, or input, and then we have our discussion. Instead of having our discussion, having public comment, and then having to have further discussion because maybe we didn't cover the subject matter. So does that work for folks? In other words, agenda item presentation, public comment, and then we have our engagement, and if necessary, a vote or decision on how to proceed. Does that work for everybody? Yes. Yeah, it's fine yeah. with me. Okay, good. And thank you for those that gave, uh, and I'll get to that. Thank you for those that gave either indirect feedback or direct feedback. What we're trying to do is run efficient and productive meetings and try to move forward with our agenda items. Several people travel uh, from out of the region, airplane flights and stuff like that, so we need to be cognizant and aware of that. Last, last item in regards to public comment is um, in order to get, get through those for this meeting and others, uh, what my goal is, is to give three minutes. Uh, hopefully that will get resolved uh, through the person's uh, presentation to us. It's very consistent with other boards. Um, and uh, if there is a clarifying question that an LTAC member has uh, from the presentation, ask, but to minimize debate back and forth because that's, you know, that, that's really not a productive way for us to get through the public comment and move forward with our further discussion. Our further discussion can can include the dialogue that we've heard from the public, but we shouldn't necessarily get back and back, have back and forth debate on an on an on an item with the public member. They're here to give us their input and their insights. Clarifying question makes sense, but to have a debate with them wouldn't be productive, in my opinion. Is everybody okay with that? Yes. 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 All right. I think we've got a public comment framework moving forward. Uh, uh, Jacob has a, an item, but just real quickly, in Southern California, we've got speaker cards up here. So as the speaker cards get completed, um, Jacob is bringing them up to me, and then uh, I am trying to figure out, is there any logical order uh, for those? Uh, for the public comments, what we would prefer is to get your insights and input, but to not have you know, 20 people come up and indicate the exact, exact same thing that the prior person communicated. You can do that, but... Uh, uh, we definitely listen to each of the public comments that come forward. So if you can bring something in addition to what other presenters have said, that would be helpful to us. Um, and so I think you have a similar framework or something like that in Southern California, and you guys will be communicating with Jacob so that I can understand what we have forthcoming for total public comments. Yeah, that's what I was going to co uh, comment about it. Um, for Southern California, if you, uh, for the public comments, if you could um, write them down, and um, hand them to Andrew, um, and then he'll com he'll communicate those to me, and we'll um, get them on our end over here in, in Northern California. All right. So thank you everybody for uh, uh, giving some feedback on that. And this this isn't locked in stone. So if we find we're still having challenges achieving our meeting goals and meeting timelines, uh, we can have further discussion about it. But I think we've kind of gone through iterations over time, and this should fine tune this to a point where I think we can get through our meetings and make sure we're engaging and hearing from the public as well. Uh, Stephen, real quick, I'm a bit confused. Jacob, do you just want them to give, you want Andrew to give you the names of the people that want to make comments, or you want the comments written down? We would prefer to have them written down. So um, let me just go there. If there's anyone, if we can just make in Southern California, is there anyone here that wants to present uh, the public comments for them to discuss? Non-LTAC members? No. So we're good in Southern California. No one at present has anything to bring uh, as a public comment. Okay. Well, when we get to that point on our agenda, hopefully around 11.05, please let us know if that changes. Okay. All right. So for today's meeting, uh, we have uh, Christine's uh, presentation uh, from the Delapo, followed by uh, who's given the presentation? Uh, Okay, all three parties will be participating in the presentation of, the, uh, of proposed alternatives to draft regulation text for the laboratory accreditation. Then we'll have public comment, see if we can achieve those before the lunch break or stagger our lunch break if necessary, take lunch, and then come back and have our committee discussion.
Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, and I thought I, I thought either Jake or I said that I did in my head. Jill Brote has has arrived in, in Northern California. Mm -hmm. Good morning. All right, so I want to thank everyone for joining us here today, especially the committee members for taking the time out last minute to meet and also to the presenters for uh, making their presentation of this alternative proposal. Um, I want to tee up this topic for all of you um, with just a little bit of background. So as far as the laboratory accreditation standard is concerned, we are, we're committed to having a quality management system in the standard that we propose to the board. We're also still committed to having on-site assessments done every two years and committed to the agreement of having one PT um, um, analyzed per year for every method subgroup analyte combination that you want to be accredited for. So we've developed a quality management system that has TNI in it. You've seen it. It's a preliminary draft. We're um, intending to release another draft soon, and we intend to present that to the State Water Board in the spring of 2019. So we're on a path. But some of you have expressed concern about this model that we have included in our draft regulations. But we're open to options since there are some concerns. And we're not married to TNI. We are married to ensuring that we have an accreditation program that meets the agency needs, that is auditable, that is enforceable, and has detail so that ELAP knows how to accredit laboratories. That's what we're married to. So what you have in front of you today is an alternative presented by Amber Baylor and team for your consideration. So, here's what we need to set the framework for this proposal that you all will consider. And I want to go through each one of them and talk to, about you in detail um, on what we mean on each one. First is, we've said this for the last two years, and we've got um, absolute um, support from our agency partners that they don't want a dual accreditation program. They don't want two separate standards from a municipal and a commercial laboratory. Data is used for the same purpose and decision making, and they don't see a difference between size or classification. So anything that you consider can't have two different standards. It's one standard for all. Second, the quality management system has to have critical elements. It must have a quality management system embedded into it, the philosophy. This is imperative. This is not a novel idea. It's used in many other industries. It's used in a lot of laboratory accreditation standards. So the system has to have this philosophy, which has continuous improvement. You have to plan how you run your laboratory, how it's operated, plan out the SOPs, implement them, make sure they're running, evaluate and make sure that they are working and then correct them. So if you have a problem, there's this feedback loop to ensure that your laboratory is working appropriately. Those are the critical elements. I'm not going to go through each one of them for you, but we've looked at this and these are the elements that we need. Third, we're looking for consensus. I'm not looking for a six to five vote, a divided vote. We're on a path to take this to the water board. If we deviate from the path, it has to be consensus or nearly unanimous for me to go to the agency partners and say, hey, this lab community in California wants something different. And I'm willing to go to bat for you if the criteria is met and you guys can come together as a community and say, we like this together as a community. So it needs to be nearly unanimous or consensus. Just so you know, even if you get there, the agency partners have already given me a clear mandate that they want TNI. And you heard that two years ago. 
so it's an uphill battle but again we're open to any options if you guys can make it happen last time is critical we're on a path we plan to release the draft which we told you at the last LTAC meeting next week and we are on target to present this to the water board in the spring of 2019 the board is you saw that at the October 2nd meeting they're worried we get indications from the agency partners that they're worried about the quality of data coming out of lab so time is of the essence we have something ready for them to adopt. So if you all can come together and say this alternative is something that you support, then I'm willing to go to the board and DVA and say we have something, we have an alternative, and the community is working together on it. So here, are, here they are. I wanted to flash them up for you if you have any questions. Um, that's basically um, my presentation. And Jacob is also here with me to answer any questions on the quality management system. Critical criteria, if you have any questions there. A uh, real quick, uh, Ron Cost just came in. Thank you very much. So we have all LTAC members here today. Um, uh, last meeting, we started in Southern California for questions. Uh, so I'll go ahead and start in Northern California this time. Um, got a good number of people up here. So are there any questions for Christine in, uh, up here? None? Southern California? None. Thank you. And just a quick item. Um, as you guys all recall, we typically get our agenda items in about a month in advance. That provides Christine an opportunity to get you know, two weeks to basically get her Lapo presentation into the packet. This was a very different meeting structure. We needed the presentation items from the parties that were attending to come in. They came in last Thursday night. Christine had to get a presentation ready, and so it was really not reasonable for her to be able to get a presentation in, in a couple of hours into here such that we can see everything in advance. And obviously some of the slides are a little different than even the packet we have. Uh, so uh, that had to be an adjustment because of the opportunity for her to be able to pull a presentation together to reflect the audience on the upcoming presentation. So, Mindy. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, cause you on? Yeah, it's on. Um, if it looks like our packets though are just missing the back page, but some of the packets have them. Oh. And so if just before we leave, if we can get copies that have all the slides. Yeah, for some reason ours just, yeah, no, we're missing pages two and four out of the, okay. yeah, it just didn't and copy And you know, on it's posted back. to the webpage. It went up Oh, it'll morning. be up there? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, never mind. Thank you. Okay, so Jacob, uh, where are we having the uh, public speakers, uh, the, the parties that are here with their agenda item today, giving their presentation for the mic? We lost your audio. So we're, we're trying to work out physically where we, we're in a different room today, so we don't have the podium. Uh, so we're just trying to identify where we want to have the public speakers uh, on the agenda item set up. So give us a moment. Okay. I'd play some Jeopardy music if we had the opportunity, but I don't have that <laughs> on cue on my phone. And for Steve, Amber, uh, the, the camera's up there. So if you did want to, yeah, but I believe in Southern California, they have to toggle between the slides. If you wanted to be on camera, you would be over kind of here-ish. Oh, Stephen, we have the slides up and then we have the camera view in the right-hand corner. Can you see me? Uh, not without my glasses. Okay, can, well, <laughs> I can we're, now. We're, we're trying to get a podium whereby the speakers can be seen and Jacob, now oh, it's on wheels. So I think we, we're close to having this set. Okay.
And for those uh, in the public, we've got about a dozen public members in the room and our board staff. Uh, right now, I only have three public speaker cards. So after uh, this presentation, we'll have an opportunity for LTAC members to ask questions of the presenters, and then we'll be transitioning to public comment. So please, uh, if you plan on uh, speaking or wish to speak, please complete a speaker card that's in the back of the room. All right, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, yes. First of all, uh, we sincerely thank State Water Board members, the ELAP team, state agency partners, and LTAC for the opportunity to present to you today. I'm Steve Jepson, the Executive Director for the Southern California Alliance of Publicly Owned Treatment Works, commonly known as SCAP. We represent over 80 public water and wastewater agencies in seven counties of Southern California. SCAP is working closely with our brother and sister organizations, tracking the development of new environmental laboratory accreditation standards. These include CASA, BACWA, CIVICWA, CMUA, CWEA, AQUA, and CAL. We have been submitting multiple, multiple comment letters to ELAP through the regulation development process, expressing our concerns with a full TNI only system for public water and wastewater labs. At the ELAP update to the State Water Board on October 2nd, CASA, BACWA, CIVICWA, CMUA, CWEA, AQUA, and SCAP all provided testimony to the State Board expressing concerns with a full TNI only system and communicating the merits of a parallel full TNI and California QMS accreditation program consistent with the Health and Safety Code sections 108259C11 and 15. The board expressed interest in our proposal and added, we as a community should show action on the parallel track initiative. So this is why we are here today. Along with continued correspondence with state board members on the merits and importance of a California QMS system, the public water wastewater lab community has banded together and quickly prepared a draft California QMS that has been shared with ELAP and LTAC and will be presented to you shortly. The draft California quality management system has been managed by Amber Baylor with South Orange County Wastewater Authority, SOCWA, and created by Bill Ray of William Ray Consulting. Amber has an advanced science degree and has worked in, managed, and now oversees a water wastewater lab. She's also a co-chair of SCAP's Water Committee and CASA's Regulatory Work Group. Bill is a highly regarded laboratory consultant with an advanced degree in chemistry, multiple publications and awards, and only 45 years of experience. I want to remind everyone this is a first draft and we welcome and encourage input to make it more robust. Josie Tellers, Water Quality Coordinator for the City of Davis, Water Wastewater, and the Civicwa Lab Committee Chair, has already done a preliminary review, review and provided valuable improvements. These improvements are not in the draft that you see today. The draft California QMS has been provided to other lab professionals in our group for review and comment. It's a work in process as we speak. SCAP and our affiliates are committed to a California QMS and are applying significant resources towards that goal. Today, you will see, hear, and have the opportunity to discuss one of the first steps in our journey towards that goal. So without further ado, I introduce Amber Baylor and Bill Ray. Thank you. 
Thank you, Steve. Uh, my name is Amber Baylor, and I am representing SOCWA, the South Orange County Wastewater Authority, today. Uh, we're a 10-member JPA, uh, Joint Powers Authority, representing water, um, city, city uh, and other utility districts. And the reason why I'm here today is because, um, as uh, Steve had mentioned on the October 2nd board meeting, the uh, board members asked what we were really doing in this space um, to bring a uh, cooperative and innovative and uh, transparent dialogue to, um, to, the, to the discussion. So we took that to heart, and uh, my agency supported um, um, providing you uh, or procuring William Ray's uh, experience and expertise in getting a California QMS off the ground. Uh, we felt like it was really important. And uh, the goals that I want to really highlight today are to provide LTAC with the framework of the California QMS for discussion. And if you look within your packet, you'll see the uh, first version of the um, of the regulation, which is uh, based out of Title 22, with the emphasis in Article 5 of the California QMS. And we want to continue to work with LTAC, ELAP, and the summit partners in the development of the Title 22 regulations that include the parallel accreditation system. I also uh, was remiss in thanking um, Christine and her um, staff. I really appreciate the open dialogue. Uh, whenever I provided public comments at the State Water Board hearing on uh, November 28th, uh, I made it very clear that we are working with the, um, with the staff here at ELAP in trying to um, work on a system that is, will work for all of the parties involved, all the stakeholders. And finally, the final goal for today is to request LTAC to form a subcommittee for the creation of, a, of the parallel accreditation system. Christine uh, and I have had multiple discussions on the need to have a single system. And what I want you guys to understand through the system that we were proposing today is that it's within the framework of TNI. So we want to make sure that you understand that um, this is not the, a completely different system. As you, uh, as you are reviewing what we are requesting, it's within that very same framework. But what it does is it provides administrative relief for utility laboratories, which we're representing today. So I come to the table from a utility management experience. Uh, I managed a water quality laboratory for uh, 10 years that uh, performed uh, water and wastewater testing for NPDES and uh, for Clean Water Act and Safe Drinking Water Act compliance. Um, so I have a very um, broad experience in uh, various matrices and if, um, uh, was the laboratory manager, also the quality assurance uh, manager as well. So I understand how technically a lot of these tests work. Uh, but now in my role as the Director of Environmental Compliance, um, I have um, an executive management. I have a responsibility to my board members to understand how the resources are being spent, um, and, I'm very, and I'm accountable to those resources that we have to end up um, um, applying into our laboratory. So what ha have we done through this process? Uh, over the last year and a half, almost two years, we've committed a considerable amount of staff training for transition to, to TNI. And in fact, uh, I, we have promoted uh, one staff member to uh, focus mo most of her uh, responsibilities on quality assurance on the crosswalk to TNI. Uh, this is a significant amount of resources. And uh, as we move into our next our budget cycle in um, this uh, new fiscal year, 1920, we're looking at hiring an additional staff. So I'm here to represent the fact that as utility managers, we, are, we have devoted the resources, we understand the implications of the full TNI, um, and it's very administratively burdensome. Um, we are posed with a lot of new water quality constraints, um, understanding what's happening, um, process control rise as we move from um, uh, traditional wastewater treatment into more IPR, DPR. We need scientists that are doing scientific work for utility laboratories, not being burdened with administrative um, 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 requirements. So like I said, we identified more staffing need needs. Uh, we're also in the midst of a requirement through um, a GASB, which is an accounting standard uh, that we have to comply with in public utilities. Uh, GASB 75 um, is a requirement for um, uh, full cost accounting for um, uh, for other pension um, or other post post uh, employment benefits. These include retiree health or a variety of other benefits that um, utilities have promised their um, uh, their employees. Uh, for our agency alone, that is represented in an increase of a 25% cost of our um, to our net position statement. 
Uh, what that means is that that additional cost of uh, the 25 of the additional 25 percent is very. Uh, it can fluctuate dramatically based on the discount rate uh, that we can get out in the um, market, which will end up driving further um, cost in the long term. Um, so the more staff that we have to bur that we have to onboard to be able to comply with regulations uh, becomes extremely uh, burdensome. Um, so I want to make sure that I can tell the board um, through um, uh, that we are using our resources wisely because they are accountable directly to the rate payers. Um, so I know that that's not necessarily, um, um, you know, with private commercial laboratories, they might not understand that same implication or where we are, but this is a, um, this is a real, real um, hard money cost that we have to consider um, as we go through um, additional staffing. So we looked at this as we needed uh, administrative efficiency. Um, and so when we were in discussion uh, with Bill Ray, um, kind of understanding uh, what would be the best way for us to move forward, um, his proposal, um, and like I said, I would uh, refer you in the document to Article 5 uh, of the proposal, which is the real heart of the California QMS. Um, what it does is it really it looks at um, the test method, both federal and state, that we're required to meet. Um, uh, for each one of the laboratories, um, and it ba is based on the quality assurance and quality control within those tests. Then it takes additional layers of uh, T&I to be compliant within that quality management system and says, what are those things that we can do to still improve to make sure we're producing data of known quality that can be auditable, enforceable, and still be within the framework that uh, Christine and her team needs to make sure that data um, is, um, is being produced in the best way for um, Californians. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Bill, which will provide the rest of the presentation uh, related to um, um, the California QMS that he offered. Unless there's, and I'll take, we can take questions at the end. Uh, one correction in the slide, that is 2000 and zero, not 2005. Um, it took a little while to figure out the uh, uh, when uh, legislation was uh, uh, authored and then uh, approved. So it took, you know, that got wrong. Uh, I am, by the way, Bill Ray. I am the sole chief proprietor, uh, janitor, and cleanup person at William Ray Consulting. Uh, you've already heard all my experiences. I will just let you know that in, uh, in conjunction with Diane Laver of Quality Assurance Solutions, we have been providing training in the standard uh, to, uh, through various CWA sections. The training is extensive. It's on a line-by-line -line basis. We expect to take 33 hours to go through the standard. Uh, also, the goal is to provide help and tools to small utility laboratories, uh, including as, as show up at some of mine, one and two person laboratories. So I'll just uh, throw that in. Uh, reading, doing standard line by line is a sobering experience, although maybe it's sober ending experience. Okay, in 2000, ELAP did seek uh, legislation to allow implementation of the NELAP requirements. They did so at the time uh, to create a parallel program. They did not substitute it in. The, uh, the people, uh, for the most part, stated they were not interested in NELAP only. They, only, they wanted to continue the existing program. Uh, so that was created. Uh, and it was operated as parallel programs until uh, the discontinued of the NELAP program uh, via uh, TNI's uh, actions uh, later on, and why we are all here now. At the time, uh, generally, the number of labs who sought NELAP accreditation stayed about 10% of the total labs. It was sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. It was. Uh, but around 10 percent. Many who stayed out expressed the issue that this was for interstate commerce. The reason people got NELAP accreditation is so they could work in other states. And so they said, hey, that's not for me. I, ha you know, I don't see the value in all of that. Uh, NELAP labs, of course, said that they had much more to do, which was true, even with what would be considered the 2003 standards at the time. Uh, they, they, there was a lot more for them 
to do, it, at, it seemed at least. Um, and then again, there was a perception that New Lake produced better quality data. Um, I don't know whether it was all the, you know, the actions you took or what, but there was a perception. ELAP actually never updated its regulations, even though an attempt was made in 2005. I should qualify that slightly. They did do some updates. However, if you look at the regulations themselves, you'll see it in the history table that uh, all but three sections have the uh, originating date of 1994 in them. There were several reasons why they should have, including they changed the fields of testing, but they did not change them in regulation. Uh, so that created an issue as well. Secondly, uh, as, uh, as was is now and happens then, there was no uniformity in the quality system components between various method sources. Uh, there was not, uh, unfortunately. Unfortunately, we still have a state of uh, lack of uniformity in quality system components, standard methods, although they have made improvements. I'll remind you all, the 18th edition is still an approved drinking water method. They got rid of older EPA methods, many of them dated from the middle 70s, although uh, several 600 series methods are still on the books. Um, in the wastewater side, 136.7 appeared for quality control. However, it states that you use the quality assurance, quality control components in the compendium of a consensus setting body. Standard methods is consensus setting, EPA is not. ASTM is consensus setting, USG, USGS is not. So it did not capture everybody. Now, it never created a uniform program I did bring props, sorry about that. Why not full T&I, the question always is. It is an extensive management system, there's no doubt about that. Uh, T&I claims it provides data of known and documented quality. That is one of their trademarks. Probably should put TM on that. Uh, an existing set of standards could be dropped in. It's already printed, we have the 2016 copy of uh, flop it in and you're done, except for a few minor details. TNI even itself is looking into things like PT frequency and alternate technical manager requirements. I was on a call uh, Monday about technical manager requirements and the discussion was about how to incorporate alternate uh, means of qualifications. Now, some people, uh, we were talking about the need for having degrees until it was pointed out that they already have an exception uh, for treatment plant operators that, don't, that uh, negates the education requirements. So it's like, okay. So they're going to work on it. They haven't come around. Of course, that's not available to us now. We'll still have to do something else. PNI uses an international standard. It creates issues in this case because the standard is for every kind of lab you can think of. If the word lab appears in the name, the standard applies. This includes food testing, cosmetic testing, other product testing, uh, of course, environmental testing. It also includes labs that calibrate. So if you have a device that needs to be calibrated, they, they're the labs included as well. Uh, the labs are also uh, metrology labs, which are the people that, say, work on your balances or your thermometers, because they go directly back to an international standard. So it is for all kinds of labs. Uh, T&I decided they would add a whole bunch of additional requirements. If you read the standard, there is italicized text, there's plain text. All the plain text is what T&I added to these things. There are some issues with implementation with some of those, and we could go into great detail as to what they are, but uh, they require a laboratory to make a decision to whether that particular little line item standard is required or not based upon some condition within the test. Uh, focuses on records almost exclusively. Uh, a lot of discussion has been whether they are too paper-centric, too much document centricity and everything like that. The standard includes both a quality system, how you would uh, determine the quality of your test results and everything like that, and a laboratory management requirement. It discusses how you, in many ways, it, it sets up how you will manage your laboratory. 
the design is around a medium to large self-contained commercial laboratory. Now, it isn't necessarily their fault. It's that when a lot of this was developed, uh, especially the NELAP standards, the uh, sessions were done at major uh, conferences located in the Midwest. And I attended a couple myself. But it makes it hard for utility labs to get to because it's, you know, in St. Louis or someplace like that. So they had those people. And you can also see it in the management system. Uh, on Monday, we had discussions about whether or not alternate uh, qualifications would lead to a reduction in the ability to uh, have reciprocity because now you, you create different requirements among the different states and everything like that. So it is still kind of that's that deal. It's drawn also, because the discussions were with those laboratories, out of the CLP program. So it, you can see a lot of the contents that was in the CLP program appear in the standards. It demands documentation, documents and records for all aspects of the laboratory, including purchasing and employment. Has duties and requirements that are not exempted based on lab size. There is nothing in the standard that exempts a laboratory from any qualification except uh, possibly, a, I would say, 5.10 in Module 2, where there is a uh, difference in reporting if, if you are a calibration lab or a testing laboratory. We're, we're not calibrating labs. So a single person may have to be management, a technical manager and a quality manager even in a uh, small lab. I have listed here uh, what the standard has for uh, what are considered documents. I apologize, I know the software appears twice. But notice here that they have in here manuals, policy statements, procedures, specifications, textbooks, posters, notices. Documents must be controlled. One of the discussions we had when we were dealing with this section, the section four, was how do you handle obsolete documents? Those have to be available in case there's historical review, but must be removed out of context of the laboratory. Many laboratories, like I have in my office, have a whole string of standard methods. Under the standard, it could be interpreted that everything except the current version goes, because it would be available. Uh, the other thing that is very common in findings is lab uh, assessors will find Obsolete, copies of obsolete documents laying around, parts of documents, uh, notes, uh, post-its, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. That's a finding against the standard. So there's a lot of control on documents in this kind of thing. And it can be any kind of media as you see up here. Records. One of the big issues, of course, with records is that they are necessary uh, for historical reconstruction of data. In other words, when somebody wants to look at some past data, they must be able to reconstruct this entirely from records. There are 19 specific records to be kept in this case. All are in the standard. Please note that, that this is where issues come up in laboratories, is if somebody can't decide whether they can reconstruct from the records, then they may demand more records. Policies and procedures. There are 30 required policies and or procedures, meaning in some cases you will have a policy only or a procedure only. In other cases, you will have both. Although some of them can be combined into a single document dealing with a subject item, it still leaves about 10 documents. This, unfortunately, is uh, in section four and is where a lot of labs don't have material because it involves things like procurement, contracting, subcontracting, complaints, uh, and comments and everything like that. Duties and responsibilities, the standard calls for management, and I don't know who this top management is. It's listed a few times. Uh, management, in, including top management, technical managers, quality managers, and then it has a boatload of authorized people who are not necessarily any of the above, but they're authorized to do certain tasks. The view that TNI tends to propose is management is up there, you have a laboratory and a business side, 
Uh, by the way, technical managers in the standard are listed as supervisors. So they would be supervisors of various sections. HR, procurement, and everybody else is off on the business side. I'll just point out to you, there are no qualification requirements for the lab manager in TNI. As a consequence, they are usually a guy with a bachelor's degree in a science and an MBA. Now for us, we have this. We have kind of a lab director and some people under them. We might have a lab director and then somebody gets touted as a supervisor and then some people under them. Sometimes we have parallels. In other words, although one person is named lab director, they are equal to their staff. I actually have a uh, uh, small utility lab that I dealt with a few years ago. Uh, there's no actual lab person. They, uh, each of the operators spends two hours, is assigned a two-hour shift to be in the lab each on a day. Uh, so they had to pick a lab director. So otherwise, they're all equivalent. And of course, the uh, single person laboratory, they're everybody. So the decisions you have to issue here are, is the lab director equal to the technical manager? In other words, is, is, are they the ones who are considered the top technical uh, or a technical person within the laboratory, or are they management? If they're management, then there's no qualifications required to be the lab director, but you would have to meet the technical manager qualifications in a one. I would see even a two-person lab that one of you is going to have to be that person. Uh, if they're the technical manager, then you have to make a decision who takes on management duties, responsibilities, and authorities. Here's some authorities that are listed. Uh, you have to uh, provide authority to personnel who manage, perform, or verify work. Uh, the quality manual authority, who gets to, uh, you know, to have control of that. Uh, uh, SOP development, uh, editing and amending authorities. Document issuing authority, who hands the documents out. Amending documents by hand. In other words, if there's some reason you could write on a document, some quick note or something like that, then you have to have somebody who's allowed to do that. Uh, non-conforming work, who deals with work that doesn't meet quality or other criteria uh, and uh, initiates the process of investigations, corrective actions, and so forth and so on. And then you have to authorize somebody to do corrective actions. I have included here the actual line items out of the standard. And I should point out that there is nothing in the standard, again, that creates exemptions, so every line in the standard is required. Also, we have some other things. Uh, TNI cannot replace an existing regulation. In other words, it must defer to the regulation. So if anything in TNI refers to, uh, say, a procedure or quality assurance or quality control, uh, and there is a regulation on the same subject, the regulation wins. So TNI may have something, but the regulation wins. So for example, we have an Appendix B procedure for method detection limits. It's a regulation. It wins. Whatever's in TNI, hopefully it's close. I'm actually working on a table of comparisons, but whatever's in the regulation would supersede what's in TNI. Um, TNI currently uses the same framework that is already in existence in laboratories. They did not invent a new quality system. Nobody has. Here's your Bible. This was the work that EPA used in order to develop a quality system in the mid to late 70s. It was work done by Deming and Schuert for the manufacturing industry. It was their idea that you did not have to test every item for quality. If you took a subpopulation of every item and tested it and set up statistical processes in order to uh, you know, make a statement about whether the, uh, the rest of the material was, was going to meet your standards, that's what you did. EPA adopted that in, as a condition in the mid-70s. The state you know, was very close behind. That was the point in which a lot of labs were going, like, you're adding 10% to my workload, because that's when they asked for duplicates or spikes or some other thing like that. Yeah, and I know because I was there arguing, you know, why my 10% workload. So uh, it has not changed. 
Uh, nothing has happened. We've added different things on it and, you know, pieces and things like that. But that is the work that it was built on. Uh, and it's also why there's no uniform system. EPA went around using that work as a way to start things, but never actually created a document that built on that, that established a uniform system. Uh, TNI does not alter any quality system criteria, making it more stringent. In other words, if the method states that the recovery for a spike is uh, 25 to 175 percent, TNI did not say, no, you got to make that smaller. So if, if a method sucks, it still sucks. So it did not alter any of that. TNI allows module four and module four permission to report data even if the quality system components are failed. And I've listed the items below in the slide. It says in there the laboratory may choose to report the data if it's appropriately qualified and discussed in the narrative. So even the quality system has allowed failures in it that you can go ahead and report the data. What our proposal is, is to adopt TNI standards as necessary to complete what is already in regulations and, and by the way, approved methods are considered regulations because they're incorporated by reference, so I just put them in parentheses. Uh, add on to round out lab operations like sample collection. They've got two sections on sample collection and sample receipt and handling. So add those in. Lots of, you know, information in there and everything like that. Uh, we want to, uh, you know, that creates a uniform system throughout. We don't have to worry about whether standard methods, additions captured what. It's all there. Um, the other thing we'd wanted to do is reduce the duties and responsibilities for truly small labs. In other words, we, you know, although the standard doesn't, it lists everything in parallel, you can write uh, a condition that says, uh, the, the system applies only to. And this is not new. There are several TNI accrediting bodies who have systems that exempt or move off to another program uh, small utility laboratories. Virginia is one, Texas is another. Uh, I will point out Oregon, as far as I know, still doesn't accredit or require accreditation of utility labs, even if there are some that are. So, um, uh, there's a mechanism to do that. Texas uh, did it through exemption and a permit. Uh, so if there's, you know, if you're issued a permit, especially as a wastewater plant, there's usually was put an exemption in there. Uh, Virginia just created a parallel program. So that is a possible event that you could create. Uh, we decided to keep the quality system manual and analytical SOP formats. Those are the uh, criteria that uh, they are, uh, with consideration for what policies and procedures to keep. Definitions, especially for the matrix portion of a field of accreditation. If you adopt TNI in full, that includes accrediting people to a field of accreditation defined as a matrix slash analyte dash method uh, techniques. So I forget all the rules and all this. But the, the difficult one in there is that matrix up front because TNI does not define the matrix for field of accreditation. It has other definitions of a matrix for field of proficiency test samples and for quality system matrices. The last one plays out in, especially in module four, where you have to set up batching and QAQC criterion based upon these matrices. And so they're, they're broken out into drinking water, aqueous that's not saline, uh, solids that are over 15% settleable, biological tissues. There's a, a nice little list there. But you're going to have to set those in because now the question is, what's a matrix? And if you think that's defined, eh, maybe not. So you have to think it, it should be in there. Uh, by the way, ours includes a reference back to the uh, fields of uh, PT sample matrix uh, definitions because you're going to do PTs. Why not make it all you know fairly straightforward? Uh, we are looking for. I think this is where I step out. And. Uh,
Point was, oh, there's my book. I don't know where my book's at. Cost me a lot of money in 1975. Thank you, Bill, for that uh, um, overview of what, you know, the California QMS really is. Um, so I just want to highlight the fact that we're requesting that the California QMS, um, why we're requesting this, um, utilities are charged with protection of public health at a reasonable cost, uh, especially to our ratepayers. Um, there's many utilities in the room who serve disadvantaged communities. Um, those utilities um, can't just be um, adding more staff um, for uh, administrative burdensome regulations. In addition, for every full-time employee utilities hire, there's a long-term retirement cost associated with that hire, which ends up increasing rates over the long run. That cost must be approved by executive management and the board of directors. The board serves also as the policy setting function at each utility. It is the board who decides on how to invest monies in personnel to comply with not only regulations, but whatever quality management system the board decides on for its specific organization. That is their job. So today, we, we respect um, Christine's perspective um, and her staff uh, for, and, and really appreciate the time that they took um, to get this um, uh, special meeting together. Uh, Christine had said that they don't support a dual accreditation system. And we're in alignment with that. We had to make various concessions within our utility uh, groups um, to make sure that we were within a parallel system within the TNI framework. A lot of, of the utility um, uh, personnel were um, still upset that you would have to still buy TNI, which is a, um, a commercial document. Um, we're trying to make concessions. We're trying to work with you all within a framework that you can have that's auditable and enforceable. Christine also noted that there are critical elements um, for a quality management system. Uh, we hired the best, uh, most knowledgeable person, one of them um, in the state, Bill, Bill Ray, uh, to help us construct a system that would work um, to meet that goal of um, the critical elements of a QMS, which we think we've done. And we would encourage further dialogue within that system. And Christine wants consensus. Now, we are representing public utility and managers. Um, I never ran, I worked for a commercial lab for a short time, but I never ran a commercial lab. Uh, we have different uh, perspectives in this. Uh, we have different needs, um, interstate commerce. Um, there's a different need that you all, economies of scale. Uh, they're just different perspectives in this. Uh, but what I hope through the discussion today that we can have a consensus uh, that you can still have a TNI, full TNI system, while we can have a system that works for um, our utility laboratories. Christine mentioned that time is of the essence through this discussion. I would agree with that in part, but I'd like to offer a pause in the discussion. Uh, the regulations that we have seen up to this point um, need to be full, more fully vetted. So when we asked Bill Ray to put together um, his take on this, it included all of Title 22. So what you have in your packet today is the full Title 22. Uh, there's a lot that Jacob and um, Christine have put in their regulations that could be uh, more that could be added to the regulations that we have proposed, make them more robust. Robust, because really that's the uh, the lock and the key mechanism uh, to open the door to allow ELAP into the utilities and make and all the other commercial laboratories and. California to allow them to uh, make sure that data is being produced of highest quality. Uh, but we want to make sure that um, through this request uh, that it's not on deaf ears and that you, we can uh, continue the conversation. So what we're doing today, um, and again, very appreciative of um, Christine and Stephen uh, getting this uh, meeting together, but we're, we're seeking feedback on the parallel system proposed. We think that it matches what you all need um, from ELAP's side, um, and I think it matches what the public utilities need as well. So what I want to do today is formally request that LTAC to form a subcommittee for the creation of a parallel accreditation system. So that means further dialogue. Uh, we need to really not release the regulations as of they are today. We need to take a step back. We need to uh, continue the dialogue that we are in. And I know that Christine has um, expressed grave concern with the, uh, with the uh, deficiencies that were identified in the last, um, in the October 2nd board meeting. Uh, I'd like to um, address that. We had, a, we, had a, um, we had one of our audits and uh, we, there were six findings in our drinking water lab. 
And uh, two of those were really a best management type of practice, but we'll incorporate those. Um, so I want to just really caution the group whenever we're using the ends to justify the means uh, through this perspective. When we're looking at deficiencies, many of these deficiencies are actually administratively re related. Uh, I, one of our deficiencies was that uh, we didn't have um, a, a, a log of all the times that we've, um, um, that we've updated our QA manual. That's fair enough. But that's not something that would say data quality being produced in the state of California is so gravely um, deficient that we're going to need a TNI system to solve all of those. What we need in this discussion is further, uh, further dialogue to be able to produce good quality uh, data. And so with that, um, would open up to any questions that you all have. And I just really appreciate your time. Well, thanks to all three of you for your time and, and bringing their presentation forward today. Um, so just a quick time check. We've got 11.03. We've had slated 11.05 for public comment. And I do want to be very sensitive to some of the parties that came from Southern California. One needs to leave by um, uh, 1.30 as a flight out. So that means basically get a comment in before lunch. So are there any, any questions with that mindset? We have at very least one public comment that needs to be heard before lunch. Or we can just delay it. Is there uh, any comments from the Northern California group or questions uh, of the presenters? Anthony. I'm sorry, I just stepped out of the room. What, um, what was that? Hey, just real, real quickly, this is Stephen in Northern California. Um, we got a lot of background noise in Southern California. It sounds like you guys are having more fun uh, down there. Um, it, <laughs> That's what they do in Southern California, Amber said. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, just the, if we can uh, reduce the background noise a little bit. I'm not sure if you guys have mutes on your mics. That would be helpful. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i mute it for now, and then when we need to start speaking, um, I'll unmute it. Thanks so much. And I'll be transitioning to Southern California after we rotate through any questions in Northern California here. So, Anthony, do you have a question of the presenters? Yes, I do. I have uh, two quick questions for Amber. And uh, the first one is the uh, – could you – a uh, little bit more detail on the training. You mentioned training that went through. Was that from uh, Mr. Ray's? And that, was that the 30-hour, 30 33-hour line by line? Uh, they have, um, so we've sent one of our, our person that we promoted, um, yes, and she's been to the one here in um, Southern California. So but, as one person from the lab w went through the training? Correct, yeah. The, the other question is, identifying more staff needed, could you give me so, just a few details on who these new staff, are these new staff members and who, are they technical right. or administrative or what? So the person that we've um, um, promoted to the, that's a great question, thank you, Anthony. Uh, the person that we promoted, she was a Lab Tech 3, um, and so we promoted her into the Lab Tech 3 um, slash QA specialist uh, position. So her role has now been shifted into um, all the administrative requirements um, for the TNI. Um, that we have, uh, we have, we run a, we uh, contract uh, for another member agencies on their drinking water side, and so uh, we're, I'm just talking about the time that's taken her now to transition to the drinking water to be compliant, and it has taken 60 to 70 percent of her time just to get us up to speed on the drinking water, not necessarily all the wastewater. So her focus has been compliance with um, what it will take us to get our drinking water side, which is. Um, about 20 to 25 percent of our, my staff's time um, um, to actually uh, be compliant with TNI. So you're not backfilling her position? Uh, I, I actually am. So I'm looking at a budgeted amount um, to go to the board uh, for a new position uh, because I know that the the additional cost associated with her with where she's going to be just doing all the all of the documentation um, for not only the drinking water but now on the wastewater side, I'm going to need another staff. So I've been in discussions with uh, our board members, uh, giving them a heads up of a FTE for this position. Um, I will tell you that um, one of my, sp one specifically, uh, one of my board members was um, um, asked us to, well, we have directive for, from our staff or from our board in general to keep administrative costs as low as possible, Steve, keep, keep costs low. But um, I've had direct conversations with one in particular about what will, the, what will happen to their labs as well. Um, and they were gravely concerned about the additional cost associated with it. Any more questions here in Northern California? Okay, Southern California, any questions down there? Yeah, this is Rich. Um, 
Can you explain to me the difference between dual and parallel? Uh, sure, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this was a kind of uh, semantics as we got into it. Uh, originally, when we looked at the draft regulations that uh, Jacob and uh, Christine had released, uh, there was a, uh, there's a sunset clause in the regulations. And as a lab uh, manager for 10 years, uh, I was brought on early as a, uh, as a lab tech and my um, uh, boss was let go. And so um, I ended up taking that position on and had to create a quality management system um, within back in 2005, actually. Um, and so when I looked at the draft regulations um, and the sunset clause, I can't remember exactly where it is, uh, the three-year clause that is in the current draft regulations, I said, oh, well, that's a dual system. So small laboratories can kind of use that framework and then apply as best they can, uh, or they can apply that same framework um, in their quality system manuals, quality um, assurance um, uh, manual, and then all their quality control through every subsequent test that they're required to do. Because I've done that. I said, oh, well, then that's the dual system. That's not a problem. But through conversations with um, Christine and her need to um, also increase their efficiencies um, in, uh, in her program, needing a single standard, uh, we came up, uh, actually, it was uh, Bill Ray's um, idea of the parallel system. Um, so that the parallel system is within the still the larger framework of TNI, um, but not sitting outside of it in a dual si side by side track. Does that make and, sense? And as a as a small commercial laboratory here, um, I I don't generally work outside of California myself, and have had no need for TNI in the past. Yet I'm being excluded from what you're presenting here today. Is there a reason for that? Uh, I don't have specific experience in the commercial side of the laboratories, um, so I thought that was out of my purview. Uh, my scope is in utility management. That's where I have uh, 14 years of experience. And so I can't speak outside of that of this, if this system works for you. Um, I'm not really sure. But if the uh, LTAC does direct um, um, a subcommittee to work with ELAP in another iteration of their draft regulations, I would encourage you to be involved um, in, that sub uh, in the subgroup um, to see what works best for your laboratory. But I can only represent um, public labs because that's my only, um, that's my uh, majority of my experience. Okay, understood. Thank you. Any other questions in Southern California? This is uh, Mike DiGavales. Um I'm a member of the public. You guys hear me? Um, actually, uh, this is Stephen Clark, the chair. Um, the public comment is not to be back and forth with the various presenters. Uh, there is an opportunity for public comment uh, that will be forthcoming momentarily. And so if you wanted to use that as an opportunity to give your thoughts on a dual accreditation system or something along those lines, that's the time to go ahead and give that comment. Sounds good. Thank you. Parallel system. And uh, uh, yeah, parallel. It. We were on dual and parallel. we understood I'm sorry. that that didn't work with Christine. <laughs> and that's the point is the collaboration. And so we're trying to make sure that the semantics are correct through the dialogue. So a parallel system that works within the larger TNI framework. Um, and you can reach me. Those the contact. Uh, my contact information is on the um, screen. Um, so if you have any specific questions, then please reach out if we don't address them in the public comment period. Thanks for that clarification, Amber. Okay, any more, any more questions from LTAC in Southern California? Yeah, this is, this is Ron Cox. <clears throat> I'd like to direct a question to Bill Ray. Uh, could you speak a little bit about, aren't we already in a dual track system? I mean, we, we, TNI is the gold standard, and you can get accreditation in California through reciprocity, then there already are, are two, two standards. There's yes. a California standard, whatever it may be, and then there's the TNI standard, which is then considered acceptable for reciprocity. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, there are systems uh, within uh, California now which allow a laboratory to seek uh, TNI accreditation from an accrediting body located, of course, outside of California. Many laboratories have used Oregon. Uh, they're now swamped with uh, marijuana uh, cannabis testing laboratories. So, uh, some labs are, if they need it, are looking at Utah as the next closest state and so forth and so on. So that, yes, that, uh, that has been allowed. And so you can be fully TNI uh, compliant, uh, mostly the 2003 or 2009 standard, not 2016, because 
No state, no AB has adopted 2016 just yet. Um, but yeah, and there's uh, apparently some other systems that are available as well. But uh, yeah, de generally, yeah. So your, your answer is that we are currently on a dual or parallel system. Well, in a way, it's it's through it's through reciprocity, or for those states who desire, or for those labs who desired to be fully TNI accredited, who could not achieve it here in California, uh, they have gone elsewhere, and the, their certificate. Uh, I don't know the complete mechanism, but apparently their certificate has been accepted at this point. So I don't know if they get additional auditing or anything like that. But that's that you in a way you you are stating correctly. Thank you. Yeah, in our in our lab, we have a certification from Utah next to the certification from California in our uh, in our entryway. Um, we get audited by both. It's it's a completely separate system, but it insulates us from all the other nonsense that's going on. Um. Go ahead, Amber. Okay. Hi, Ron. Thanks for the uh, question. And yeah, we have been operating. That's where the deficiencies have been identified currently is uh, through um, the dual system in California, which is um, um, we had when we had our audit it was like we had the TNI uh, crosswalk as well. Uh, but I, I want to just kind of emphasize through your comment uh, that what we're proposing um, today is a parallel system within the TNI framework. So just want to make sure that we're clear on that uh, instead of a, another separate system. Okay, any, I, I do have two parties in Northern California that do have questions, but I'd like to close out Southern California from the LTAC members. Are, is, is there anybody else down there? No. Excellent. So we'll close out up here in Northern California with Jill and Andy and then transition to public comment. Going along with your question, Amber, or your statement rather. So do you envision this system being applicable to all ELAP labs or just utility labs? Uh, I'm speaking about, I'm speaking for utility uh, labs. I mean, we devoted the resources uh, to bring this to the table. We looked at what would work for utilities. This is what works for utilities. So I can't speak of um, uh, uh, other commercial laboratories. I don't run them. I don't know what, you ne what your needs are. Uh, but I am um, specifically focused on um, utility management. So when you're asking LTAC to form a subcommittee, I guess we're, I, it would help us to know what you wanted that subcommittee to work on. Is it only for utility labs or is it for all of the ELAP labs? That's a great question, actually. Um, so the proposed draft regulation that is today um, is for um, all laboratories. So whatever, um, you know, this is a very first, first level draft. This is what I know what works for um, utility laboratories. I, I'm not sure, but it would be to, um, if you want to be on the subcommittee and to see what works and yeah, through the you know, negotiated process, then it could be applicable to you too. I just don't know. Because without that, then it is a dual system. Without it being applicable to all labs, then it is a dual system. Because so, there are commercial labs that are not TNI and right. would be excluded for this, which is what Ron was talking about. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. This is Bill. Um, I will point out that in the uh, in uh, section 64802.00a, it stipulates that a laboratory is to make a decision as to which system it will follow. It does not create a system based upon who the laboratory is. The laboratory itself gets to make the decision. So it can pick full TNI or the the uh, the parallel track and. Um, so it doesn't matter now which who the lab is. It can be, uh, as we have done with uh, things like uh, using a, an AWWA or CWA lab analyst certificate, focus in on utility uh, publicly owned utility labs. But at this point, the draft you have before you is uh, applicable. To, you know, the choice is applicable to all labs without restriction. So, the, uh, if you, it, I would encourage you being involved in the subcommittee, should it be formed? Uh, this is Andrew from at Southern California. I need to interject just a second. Um, uh, we're having issues with next door with volume. Apparently, there's a court case going on, and they're going to throw it out because they're they're getting too much noise. 
I explained to them that it's next door, it's not us, but they want us to try to maintain a lower voice, whatever that means, <laughs> even though we're being quiet. So uh, I'll be sitting here next to the microphones uh, or next to the mute button as best I can to, if you guys can just pass the microphone next to Shall each other. closer to the speakers? Yeah, yeah, I think that might be, we might have to speak kind of directly into the microphone as a, with light voices so that I'm, we don't get in trouble. The judge has his priorities wrong. LTAC's more important. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interject. I think we can get... Don't, don't mute just yet. Uh, okay, go on. Right. Steve, uh, can I throw in a comment here? We've got Andy up here, and then, I, yeah, David, you can maybe follow and maybe close it because, again, we've got public folks that are sure. in comments in before they need to fly out. All right, I'll try to whisper my comments. So I'm not sure if this is a, a question for Amber or for Bill, but as I understand it, since you're talking about a parallel system within the TNI framework, you're essentially saying take the TNI 2016 standard, but leave out a number of clauses. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's where the administrative efficiency comes in. Um, so reducing the, um, all, the, all of the components that are not um, uh, applicable or not uh, feasible for utilities to um, implement. Okay, thanks. All right, David, if we can close out with you Okay, yeah, uh, I'm going to uh, make, make the observation that under the en Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Act, ELAPS actually mandated to offer two types of accreditation. It's real specific. It says that ELAPS will offer TNI and traditional California ELAP. One track is not actually an option. What they're proposing here at this point is offer neither of them. To offer neither uh, traditional ELAP accreditation nor actually full-on TNI accreditation. And that's the current system. I'm not even talking about the proposed system. All right. Thank you, David. So now I'm obligated to give Christine an opportunity to respond, and Renee asked if she can close out. We're very briefest. So, Christine, uh, go ahead and respond to uh, David if you wish, and it looks like legal counsel is prepared as well. Yeah, I'm going to defer to Kim Niemeyer, who is the counsel for ELAP, who in reads and interprets the act and the regulations that pertain to ELAP. The statute actually says may. We may. Um, so we don't have to offer TNI and another alternative. And, and actually, I think that's something that's been a little confusing for people. What we're proposing in our regulations is the ELAP standard. It will be the California standard. We are not a TNI accrediting body, and we aren't going to be in the near future. So what's being proposed in the regulation is a California standard. So if the California standard, um, you know, had a dual track, we could do that, but um, that would be the California standard. We're not offering TNI and something else. Our California standard is going to be based on TNI. There's some stuff being left out, and this proposal would leave out more, but we're not offering TNI. So just so that's clear, and our reg say our our statute actually says that we may offer TNI. We are not right now. We're not going to be accrediting bodies in the near future. Okay. And to close out, Renee had a very Renee Spears up here had a very brief comment. You'll need to get the mic. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Allison. Hi, this is Renee. Um, I just wanted to make a brief comment with regard to the view that um, uh, the state agency partners take. Our concern, our mission is uh, to safeguard public health and the environment. And I can understand administrative burdens. However, we do have to look for the safety of um, essentially citizens of this state. And everything is weighed against that. And um, that, that's paramount of importance. Thank you for that comment. As utility managers and those on the front line of uh, protection of public health, we take that very seriously. It is our number one mission of protection of public health and the environment. So I want to make sure that it's clear that we're within that same um, mission um, as, we're pro as we propose the system. So um, uh, it's not um, against anything that we are, um, any of our boards would represent, um, would be willing to produce data of, of lower quality. All right, so thank you very, 
Oh, Bill, you're I just killing me. Add, add this. <laughs> I just brought this up. This okay. is a data package produced by a TNI accredited laboratory. Uh, it is complete and full. It and its 15 brothers and sisters are pretty much like this, about uh, 1,000 to 1,500 pages. I can tell you now, having done the data validation, it's still got crap in it. You, TNI itself does not protect and guarantee quality. This is an example of it. The project people had to spend hours deciding what to do with the information they got. So it doesn't, you know, it, I would just tell you, it does not guarantee anything. It provides a lot of stuff. This is paper, and I did print it off because um, it's my prop, but it is, uh, you know, uh, evidence that TNI itself doesn't guarantee anything. It requires action and effort by all, including the agency partners. They need to put in as much effort as well. So uh, I only think good news out of this is I got paid by the hour. Okay, I'm going to take the chair's opportunity to close this out um, because it's uh, 1125 and I've got a stack of cards up here. I thank everybody for the healthy uh, discussion, the time that the presenters had, Christine for preparing her presentation, and for the question from LTAC. We're going to transition to public comment in, in Northern California first, but to help me understand, are there any pub, we did have one public, public comment in Southern California earlier. Is there anybody else down there, just so I know? Tobin. You still want to comment? No, I'm good. All right, uh, I think uh, we, the uh, gentleman withdrew his comment, so we're gonna, we're fine. We don't have anyone else here that needs, uh, wants to present or talk. Great, thank you. And the gentleman, I'm, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Um, we appreciate uh, uh, that you've deferred given the com conversation that's been had. Okay, so in Northern California, this is how I'm gonna handle this. A little different from those of you that are trade, I have a better sense of terms, trade association groups that normally get the priority presentations up front. Um, I'm going to have you be after uh, some of the folks that are representing a small organization. That small is not appropriate. They're individual organization. And I'm going to go in reverse alphabetical order. So uh, for three, and I've got a timer since we don't have one. So I'm just going to set my timer so you hear it go off so that we can try to get this done prior to the lunch break. Uh, and we'll go from there. So the first is uh, Cindy Amnes. A lot of your last name is Zernicki. Whew, there we go. Thank you, Cindy. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody, ULAP staff and Amber and Steve and Bill for presenting this alternative. Very helpful. Um, a lot of the comments that I wanted to make have already been made. So there's a couple of things um, additional that I'd like to say. First of all, I'd like to propose that the board either have a hearing or a workshop to go over some of these ideas and more, more comments from the um, general lab community. And I'd also like to get a copy of the proposal that was made today or ha know where it can be made available so that everybody can see it, um, the general lab community in general, so we can make some comments. Um, and that is all. Everybody was very thorough, so thank you very much for that. That's phenomenal. One minute. That's a record. <laughs> all right. So thank you. Um, and it, again, there's an opportunity to ask a clarifying question. All right. Thank you. Uh, and then next will be Pam Schemmer. Actually, I'm sorry. So we do have the opportunity for LTAC members to have received feedback from the public and for them to um, have a slot to fill in for that party um, because we do not have call-in options. And so Allison McKenzie uh, is going to get three minutes to, uh, uh, pub to produce a public comment for Pam Schimmer. Thank you. Um, I received this public comment from Pam Schimmer at Test America. Uh, Pam said that she uh, regrets that she's not here today, but she uh, thanks you for the opportunity to provide this statement, and I'm going to read her statement. The expert committee very clearly 
indicated a dual system is not effective. California ELAP agreed and proceeded to develop a single accreditation system. A relatively few individuals representing municipal labs continue to stand in the way of ELAP making this a system worthy of the state, which has always been known as the leader of environmental guardianship. The State Water Resources Control Board is bending to the pressure of these few individuals who do not want to follow a quality system, a system that would assure the millions of Californians that their water supply and environment is safe. These few individuals are objecting to do what they perceive as extra work for them and their labs. Um, this work being additional documentation and internal checks that would give peace of mind to all Californians. As has been brought up many times, the TNI, TNI standard is scalable and can be implemented in smaller labs efficiently. Californians are counting on ELAP to monitor that the process is reliable, not to allow a lesser system for single person labs directly affecting public health. As Californians, would we allow any other industry that impacts public health, medical, pharmaceutical, food, etc., to have lower standards because they are small? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Freezing through these. My timer hasn't gone off, so we don't know what obnoxious noise it's going to make. Um, next is Dan Jackson. My name is Dan Jackson. I'm the laboratory director for the Union Sanitary District. I'm the lab director for a four-person wastewater utility lab. Um, and what I'm concerned about, um, what my agency is concerned about, is how much is all this going to cost? And that's a real question. And um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that question. But my recommendation is that LTAC and or ELAP um, secure somebody knowledgeable um, and have them investigate what the costs are going to be. Um, and I'm bringing this up uh, actually in direct contradiction to the previous speaker. Uh, the State Water Board has recognized the value that small municipal labs bring to the agencies that are producing the drinking water and treating the wastewater. And numerous State Board members have made numerous comments over the course of this discussion recognizing the value that these municipal labs bring to California's um, environmental regulation and drinking water safety. So um, the, the proposal to um, basically bring TNI to all California labs, and I understand it's not exactly TNI, but it's 99.5% to all California labs, and the cost impacts that will have on municipal labs, which do not have the ability to raise their prices um, to compensate for increased costs, um, and the and the possible scenarios that may play out from this, um, I think call for somebody to take a look at what are going to be the consequences of proceeding down the path that you're proceeding down. Um, in particular, if the costs for municipal labs go up dramatically, then a number of them will withdraw from accreditation. Um, this will be great for the contract labs if we get more work, but will not be great for the um, for the operations of the agencies that treat wastewater and produce drinking water. And I think the State Water Board has recognized that. So th it's, real, it's a real question mark. Is, is this going to be a crushing economic burden, or is it trivial and we're all worried about nothing? So that's why I think ELAP needs to uh, hire somebody knowledgeable to look into this and produce a reasonable range of costs for implementation and, and for maintaining this new accreditation system. Uh, in this small sector. And it's not, it's not a small sector. It's a sizable percentage of ELAPS accreditation. I don't, um, maybe 40% um, small municipal labs, 40% of ELAPS certificates, something like that. It's not, it's not a small number of people. It's a very large number of public agencies that provide a critical service for California. So um, I know that the cost for implementing TNI is not zero. It's greater than zero. I don't know if it's a crushing administrative burden or if we're all worried about, uh, we're overly worried about it or not. So somebody needs to look into this and produce some kind of range of costs. And then you could have an idea of whether you're going to encounter unacceptable, unintended consequences from proceeding um, along, this, along this path. Great. Thank you, Dan. Um, Jacob did uh, 
raise his hand, I think he wanted to respond to that, or were you just telling me hello? No, I was um, making a comment or motioning to you that um, we were hearing some laughter on the, and I was sending a message to them to see if and gotcha. Southern California. Okay, thanks. Um, I will um, go ahead and comment on um, Dan's um, comment. There is that um, part of the uh, administrative, uh, the formal rulemaking process that. Um, there is an economic analysis that is included with the package. Thank you. And just to clarify, that is part of any regulatory packages, package that is brought before the state. And that is already publicly available or will be part of your submittal package to the board? Correct. It's part of the um, submittal to the board. Uh, we are currently, again, right now, in the preliminary stages. We have not entered into the formal rulemaking process, but it, that is, uh, once we get to that stage, um, then all of that becomes public. Okay, thank you. Um, we're moving forward with parties that are repre representing large groups, and so kind of consistent with the uh, framework of uh, the board. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and give five minutes to each. I know one's requested 10 minutes, but uh, I don't think we'll be able to wrap up in the morning if, if we give the full 10. So five minutes for each, and again, going in reverse alphabetical order. Uh, I do have one that is um, uh, from an external party asking that another party give uh, their comments. So uh, going with uh, reverse alphabetical order, um, because I was a, I'm a Clark, so I was was always first in school or close to first in school. I couldn't understand anybody that had a last name of Z was very bitter about that. Um, I started with a Z, so we'll go ahead and start with Josie Tellers, uh, representing Civicwa Lab Committee, CWEA Lab Committee, and she's with the City of Davis. So you have five minutes, Josie. <laughs> no, because they're actually they actually got us on schedule, so. Uh, so yeah, five All right. minutes. Where to begin? I'm here again saying the same thing uh, in support of not just public utility labs, but also commercial labs. Um, the reason being is I wore bo both hats. 19 years in commercial lab, both large and small, familiar with CLP, TNI, and uh, wore the hat from a mere dishwasher to a project manager. So I'm pretty much I could say done it all. And then 17 years in public agency with City of Davis and had the greatest opportunity to put the City of Davis laboratory that at the time is a two person lab and still is, to get certified by ELAP for the first time since its existence. So I wrote it. I know the title 22 back and forth. And so, now that I'm in public agency and going through this journey of changing or updating our standards, I kind of have, I would say that I feel the pain of a lot of laboratories. Going, going to this, um, the California QMS that uh, Bill drafted for SACWA and the summit partners, I should say. Thank you so much for doing that. And um, thank you for ELAP and LTAC to give us a forum or a po podium, the podium today to have this opportunity to speak about this uh, model. Let's just say for now it's a model. Um, I also would like to thank Kim Niemeyer, I hope I pronounced it correctly, by putting forward the statue and the, uh, the May choice that the state of California has. And I'm hoping that the May includes the, the consideration for the draft California QMS. So without further ado, the draft QMS is inclusive. It's TNI based. And I could honestly say that it also will serve the commercial laborato laboratories. Current Title 22 regulations covers, covers commercial laboratories that does not do interstate testing, so you will still be covered by this model. Um, secondly, as you know, CWA has been proactive 
with getting to know the standards. And so most of our members, both Civicwa, CWA, BACWA, everybody that are members of various um, clean water associations had undergone uh, training with the TNI standard, the 2016 TNI revision 2.1, and we will continue to do so. So two years ago, we only look, know it as 2016 TNI standard. Now we actually know line by line, as Bill has said, we were undergoing training and will continue to do so. Um, as I was preparing today's meeting, I'm trying to put together a binder, and I came across the email that I, that I wrote and sent as a public comment two years ago. It's dated November 2nd, 2016. I said, for your consideration, portions of, portions of TNI pose the following concerns for the publicly owned laboratories. One, module two, section four, four to five includes requirements that are superseded by city or public agencies policies and procedures that includes but not limited to selection of vendors, awarding tenders and contracts, creation of job description and requirements, leave of absence, disciplinary action, hiring and firing, uh, designation of title. Two, regulatory requirements superseded the TNI standard for the CFR Part 26. The methods that we follow, regardless of what standard we use for accreditation, still remain the same. If I'm performing gravimetric methods, general chemistry method, methods, um, uh, or turbidity, for example, commercial labs, non-commercial lab, we follow the same method. Nothing will change. Now, the draft Q QMS um, provides clarity of the hierarchy and importance. The methods, the state and federal requirements, and TNI modules or section were two, were both were silent. So changing from where we are now to where we're going, or we would like us to go, it satisfy our goal to better our accreditation standards. And it's TNI based. Need you so, to wrap up, Joshi. Okay, lastly, message for the, TN, for the state agency partner. I plead the state agency partner consider this model. And finally, whichever model or standards we adopt, that what you ask us to do, you do it yourself as well. And the laboratory is under you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, we have a comment from the director of TNI, Jerry Parr. Um, can't be here, so Allison McKenzie uh, will give that uh, comment. Allison, even though you've asked for up to 10 minutes, I need you to keep it to five. Thank you. This is Jerry's comments, so I will do everything in my power <laughs> to speed read the pertinent part. Thank you very much. So these comments are provided by the NELAC Institute, and uh, the comments are submitted in response to a meeting packet provided, by, provided for this meeting December 13th for the LTAC. They, these comments address a proposal to create a parallel accreditation system in California. Uh, page 41 of the meeting packet contains proposed language for a California quality management system. TNI has reviewed this language relative to the 2016 TNI standard and offers up four main comments. The first, uh, section 64808B4 and C. The pro proposed language selects some but not all of section 4.2.8.4 and 4.2.8.3 relating to the quality manual. Attachment one has reorganized, and his attachment one is what he's referring to, uh, has reorganized these two sections into two groups, one showing what is proposed to be retained and one showing what would be eliminated. For the language to be eliminated, the word not has been added to show how this would become a non-requirement and then comments added to several of these to show how they are in fact relevant. All of the language in these two sections should be contained, retained completely. Sex, number two, item two, uh, 64808B5. The proposed language appears to delete most of section four and five of the TNI standard, retaining only section 5.3 and 5.5 through 5.9. 
Using, once again, using the approach Bruce LaBelle offered up a few years ago, the missing language from section four and five is shown in attachment two with the word not added to show these requirements in the TNI standard would not apply to California laboratories. A review of this language shows how such an approach greatly weakens the laboratory requirements. General comment on parallel accreditation program. As stated in the slide on page 15 of the meeting packet, ELAP has a history of poor progress on revising their internal regulations for a parallel system. And this is a common problem with other state agencies. One of the major benefits of simply citing the TNI standard is that the state does not have to use their resources to revise the standard. They can rely on 100 plus scientists and regulators involved in a TNI expert committee to perform this work. The TNI committees are open to anyone to participate and provide California laboratory professionals opportunity to work within the system to continually improve the standard. Item four, TNI resources. One of the major reasons the expert panel endorsed using the TNI standard has to do with tools, templates, and training that TNI has developed to assist laboratories and states implementing the standard. <coughs> These are summarized in, his atta in Jerry's attachment three. No such resources exist for a parallel system, thus placing undue burden on laboratories. Note regarding Appendix A, pages 48 and 49 contain a quick reference guide for policies and procedures citing many sections of the TNI standard. However, this document is not mentioned in the draft proposed regulation and its context is unknown. And I just would like to, to finish up by providing just one of the examples from um, uh, the deletion or omission of item J in section 4.2.8.4 uh, as per the uh, exclusion by in the California Quality Management System. Item J says procedures for ensuring the laboratory reviews all new work to ensure that it has the appropriate facilities and resources before commencing such work. What this states then by deleting this section is that a lab could commit to performing tests for which it does not have the equipment or the resources to do so. And that's just an example. But I believe my last question would be, can this be provided uh, by uh, ELAP to the, the, um, these comments to the rest of the group, the attachments? And that would be my request to Christine yeah, they, Jacob, go ahead. Yes, um, these comments will be included in the um, under the LTAC tab um, on the ELAP website. Thank you so much, and thank you all. Allison, thank you for getting through that. I did receive a copy of that prior to the meeting uh, and could not distribute it via the Bagley Keen Act violation, and it was a pretty lengthy set of comments. So thank you for keeping that to five minutes. <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh, very very appreciative that you were able to uh, keep it within that time frame. Uh, next is Sarah Burke uh, with the uh, California Water Environment Association. And Sarah, you've got three minutes. Since you asked for three instead of five. And Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Morning, everybody. Um, thank you for holding this special meeting. I really appreciate it, and I'm sure we all do. I know it's a big effort for everybody. Um, so I'm Sarah Burke from Ora Loma Sanitary District. I'm the plant chemist. I'm a one-person lab. And I'm the CWEA lab committee chair. Um, the CWEA lab committee supports this new alternative draft regulation. Um, there's been a lot said already. Um, I think I would just like to add that, so under these new draft regs, we've got full TNI, or TNI with stuff removed. And all of our utility um, city special district labs could much more easily meet the demands of the latter choice, TNI with stuff removed. Um, so anyway, you guys are gonna have a discussion this afternoon. And I was just wanted to put out one concept you might discuss would be something we've kind of already touched on, but maybe you, this draft standard could offer T&I to everybody. And the second 
alternative, the alternative to um, non-commercial labs. Um, I think I've picked up on the fact that some people don't like that. Some of the smaller commercial labs that T and I would also be hard on. But um, I just think it's worth discussing in order to keep, I don't know how many utility labs open. We need to look at something like that. I know I will drop my certification if we go with the current draft regs. Um, I did a economic analysis. I talked to a, um, a consultant about what it would take them to get me T and I certified, as I don't have time to do it. And the result was over $100,000 in their hours and their time to comply with all those policies and procedures. Um, and then to maintain the um, current draft regs that T and I, with two things removed, it would be around $50,000 a year of my time to meet those new standards. And if I chose to drop my certification, if the current draft regs are adopted, it'll cost me perhaps $20,000 a year to send my stuff out. And I have a very simple NPDES permit because I too, like Amber, am part of a Joint Powers Authority. So we do some testing at my plant, but um, the majority of the tests and limits are about two miles down the pipe before the water goes into San Francisco Bay. So I would be um, one of the least impacted by the commercial lab costs that we would incur with um, definitely between 15 and 20,000 a year at this point. So if the new regs pass as they're currently written, we've got an economic impact no matter what happens, if we adopt it or if we don't. So um, I hope you have an interesting discussion this afternoon. I hope that you consider something for the municipal labs and that we do need an alternative to the current proposed draft rate. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And next, is it Adam Borchard or Barchard? Borchard, thank you, uh, with Aqua. <clears throat> Anyone else that has a time limitation or a travel, uh, they can go before me. Uh, the last is Amber Baylor, and I'm expecting yeah. she may be staying <laughs> for the rest of the meeting. So uh, Amber <laughs> is right. uh, a BA, you're BO, so you come first. Okay. And you got, uh, you would requested three minutes. Yeah, all right, hopefully fewer. Um, first of all, thank you uh, for holding this special meeting. I want to thank uh, Ms. Sotelo and the ELAP staff and the broader um, staff at uh, Division of Drinking Water and the State Water Board. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Aqua and the California Municipal Utilities Association. My colleague, Mr. Jonathan Young, uh, had a previously scheduled commitment, so he was not able to attend today's meeting. Um, two items of discussion um, that I want to mention. One is the dual system of our dual accreditation standard, and the second is a public workshop and meeting. Uh, first, both Aqua and CMUA have uh, local public uh, water agency members that do support the dual um, standard accreditation. And um, while ELAP has uh, clearly stated that they do not support it, um, we do appreciate that uh, ELAP is not married to TNI and is open to um, reviewing alternatives and appreciate the uh, presentation earlier today. I think that's a step in the right direction to consider it. And um, Aqua and CMUA would support the creation of a subcommittee to look at that proposal um, for a parallel track uh, a little bit more thoroughly. Second is the public workshop. Um, the public at large outside of LTAC has not had an opportunity to look at and um, revisit the draft regulations since the summer of 2017. So uh, both Aqua and CMUA would support having a public workshop. And uh, I thank uh, Ms. Sotelo for mentioning that as part of the adoption hearing in uh, spring 2019, a, a workshop would be included. So those are my two comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. But this uh, last is uh, Amber Baylor uh, representing Sockwell. Hi, again. <laughs> so I uh, just want to respond specifically to um, the comment made um, by the representative of Test America. Um, I actually used to work at Test America for a brief time. Um, so I feel, um, <laughs> I feel, yeah, right. Raise your hand if you worked at Test America, right? <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, right. We have a pretty good representative in the room. Okay, so I, I'm I'm uh, basing my comments on um, I, I felt very strong language coming from um, the presenter uh, Pam uh, Shimmer on this. Um, I, I want to make sure it's clear for the group. Um, we are not requesting uh, lower data quality because we just simply can't afford it, and we don't want to do more work. I mean, I think that that's um, it's. Um, uh, we would never request lower standards. I mean, we are, uh, we're in the business of producing high quality water on both uh, the drinking water and the wastewater side. Uh, so to categorize this effort as um, anything less than that is um, at its uh, face value um, unrepresentative of the professionals who are engaged in uh, protection of public health on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I want to make sure that that is not categorized and that um, the, what we are requesting is a system that works for um, our utility laboratories um, within the TNI framework. So just want to make sure that um, those uh, representatives in the room that feel like um, that we're requesting something that of, is of lower standards, that's not at all what we're requesting. Um, so just want to make sure that that's, that's extremely clear. Uh, and then I'll finish up my comments um, within this framework of um, this parallel system. Um, a point made by Josie, which I thought was a really good one um, through our discussions, is that CWA and other industry groups, Civicwa, uh, Bakwa, have been sending all the utility representatives to the um, training sessions for TNI compliance. And that those efforts aren't lost in this discussion as we move forward in this um, new iteration, this new um, uh, system that we're proposing. So um, the work that's already been done uh, to be in that in compliance um, is not lost uh, through this. And uh, we aren't requesting anything lower uh, uh, quality standards. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Amber. Hi, this is Andrew from uh, Southern California. We have a last minute entry here that I um, wanted to talk. It's a comment from the ACIL. Um, and uh, Bruce Godfrey's representative is going to be. Is that okay to present that? Yes, so Brad represents ACIL. ACIL has submitted comments to Brad, just like others have received comments, so he can give, give his uh, uh, presentation or give his comments for ACIL. Um, Brad, you have, as, as given to the larger organization represented, representation groups, you have five minutes, which will close us out perfectly at noon on schedule. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, this uh, memo is from uh, Bruce Godfrey to Christine. Uh, uh, Sotelo, uh, subject ACIL comment on the proposed two-tier California lab accreditation system. So, ACIL, the National Trade Association for Independent Scientific Testing Organization, supports ELAP's path to establish, a cal establish California as a leader in environmental stewardship and public safety by adopting the TNI standard of practices for all laboratories submitting data to California regulatory programs. ACIL understands a small coalition of small municipal laboratories in California are persuading the Water Board to implement a two-tier accreditation system exclusively for their needs. This, these laboratories seek to operate at the substandard level with respect to data quality, defensibility, record keeping, and transparency. They appear unwilling to meet consensus requirements for laboratory standards of practice agreed to and defined by the US EPA and more than a dozen state agencies. The TNI standard defines what is necessary and sufficient for laboratories to generate environmental test and measurement data of known quality to support environmental regulatory programs in the U.S. When the Water Board accepted ELAP, uh, or accepted ELAP from the California Department of Health, ELAP was ineffective, inoperable, ungovernable, and unaccountable, an embarrassment for all Californians. The smaller, municipal, uh, the smaller municipal and utility labs are ELAP's legacy from CDPH and were left alone by ELAP, unregulated and unaccountable for incremental improvement to their lab practices for almost three decades. It's now the Water Board's responsibility to hold all California labs accountable to generate test and measurement data that meet national standards for accuracy, repeatability, defensibility, and accountability. It's time to bring these labs up to standard levels of practice recognized elsewhere in the U.S. Through the expert review panel process, ELAP learned that smaller municipal and utility labs' fears and concerns relating to implementing the TNI standard in their labs. ELAP conducted outreach, workshops, webinars, training sessions, and other activities to assist smaller labs uh, to understand the changes in the program and their compliance and training needs going forward under the TNI standard. ACIL partnered with ELAP to address the training and implementation issues specific to small labs and the scalability of the TNI standard. 
Small labs can conform to the TNI standard. ACIL thinks the small labs should begin, uh, begin the work to conform rather than trying to reverse what the people of California need from labs that serve California's regulatory programs. In addition to, be, to being undesirable, the ERP conferred upon ELAP's leadership and many of us at LTAC a full understanding of the unworkability of a two-tiered standard substandard laboratory accreditation program. Data generated by laboratories conforming to the TNI standard are technically and legally defensible. Attributes minimally required by California's attributes minimally required by California's regulatory programs. Data generated by substandard testing laboratories share neither of these attributes. The TNI standard is scalable. Dozens of one to six person labs across the U.S. are TNI conforming. Those individuals that would have you believe otherwise likely have no experience implementing the standard and are unwilling to attempt addressing the requirements. Test and measurement data of known quality is critically important to the functionality and legitimacy of regulatory programs and the regulators making decisions based on these data. As ELAP and the Water Board evaluates this ill-advised suggestion of a two-tiered accreditation system, ACL members are asking, which segments of California's population deserve a substandard drinking water delivered by utilities offering substandard laboratory services? Is that your close, Brad? That is the close. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so um, I'd like to do on that note, uh, kind of, Brad kind of dropped the mic, um, <laughs> is instead of having back and forth, let's, let's everybody go to lunch. Uh, and we'll be back at 1.15. Um, and uh, now the meeting, I think we had originally had the concept that we'd have a meeting until 3. Uh, the agenda says till 2.30. Um, there's already been the past of us having a lot of dialogue about multiple ways of accreditation. I'm sure every LTAC member is going to want to have some discussion today. What I'd encourage you all to do is ponder your comments over lunch to try to keep them relatively concise. Um, to address the presentation that was given to us and the time and effort that was put in to see if we can, if we can accomplish uh, wrapping our meeting up at 2.30. One 1.30 at would be great. But at 2.30, um, so that in my mind, as I told one other LTAC member, no, 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 it's probably going to run over. Um, but uh, let's do what we can to try to stay on time. All right, so be back, ready to go. Mike's on at 1.15.
check, check. There we go. You check. Yep, we can hear you. All right, cool. We're leaving you guys on mute until uh, 115. Sounds good. We're just waiting for Stephen to return.
Hey everybody in Southern California, this is Stephen. Um, uh, Christine is not in the meeting yet and does need to be here, so we're going to pause. Uh, well, it's only 11, 114 now, but imminently 115. So we will uh, start when she comes into the room. Can everybody in Southern California hear me okay? Chris, are we on in Southern California? Yes, we're here. Okay, excellent. So um, I'd just like to take a quick moment before we get started, maybe to, uh, ground rules might be too strong, but just to kind of lay out a, a mindset of how I'd really like to see us all, all proceed. Um, dating back to a couple years ago when we discussed the subject matter of multiple accreditation systems or what a modified system might be. Um, we all have very strong opinions. Uh, we've all been in our careers for quite a long time. And so what I'd really like to make sure is that we're making, if you have a comment to make, make it about your position and the subject matter at hand and how you feel about it and less about the parties that might have a different opinion um, because I don't think that really moves the subject matter forward. Um, so if we can, as much as possible, stay on track with that. I think then uh, there won't be anybody who is uh, feeling jaded or insulted and we can stay focused on discussing the subject matter, the content, rather than our personalities. So um, there is nothing on our agenda except for discussion. So I think I was thinking on, at lunch, I think the best way to handle this is um, on a discussion item from any of the LTAC members and maybe down in the weeds on a subject, what, you know, what about this or what about that? Uh, versus the satellite view of, you know, do you support or not particular subjects. So for a particular dialed in the weed subject, I'll probably throw it out there. Are there other LTAC members that have a suggestion or opinion on how we might address that? Um, because otherwise it's just, I think there's the subject matter is going to be all over the board. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. And I might have to interject and just say, okay, everybody say your piece and let's get to a point of what our next steps are. That makes sense? Otherwise, the the agenda is open. How about in Southern California? Does that work for you? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yes, yeah, fine. Okay, so play it by ear a bit. So Christine has the mic for a moment. Well, I wanted to see if it was okay if Jacob was here with you, the rest of the committee, since he is an integral part of drafting the regulations and a part of the program. So I hope you all don't mind. Instead oh. of me having to say, Jacob, come here. Jacob, come here. We've always had ELAP okay. staff uh, in the room, ready to step up, and sitting at the table isn't a perfunctory uh, title obligation of an LTAC member, uh, but is, uh, you're here to, for the dialogue, so I don't have a problem with that. Okay, so again, we're gonna start in Northern California, subject matter discuss, go down to SoCal, see if there's any comment on that, um, and I don't know. We'll just go around the table and whoever gets their hand up first, I suppose, Jill's already, Jill's ready to go, so we'll start with Jill. I guess just to kind of bring focus more to this discussion, does Steven or Christine or Jacob, for that matter, want to like present a question for the group like, for our focus of this discussion? Sure. So one of the, the that was my thought on the way over is, do I just go? There's been a request of us to have a a, a uh, uh, working group, and then also I, I got to get to the right page. Is do we want to just put that out there? Uh, I think that's starting at the satellite point first is, and I, I think there's going to be a lot of detailed potential questions about the proposal first. So I, that's my thought is if we, if we do that and try to get, get done immediately, that there's too many details that we, we'd probably miss. So I don't have a recommendation other than starting in the general 
category first but allison i just have a question it feels like we're doing what we did over the course of at least one if not two meetings where we took the standard and discussed the merits of each section of the standard we've already done this once before is am i missing something here so you're correct that we have done it before but we we dealt with different sections of the standard merits of those a vote and then nowhere elap stood on that after engaging the state agency partners and the external advisory group what we have though is a different proposal with different sections of the standards focused on christine's given her comments on the things that she would like to see and so i think by default to suggest that I think for us to suggest that we already have discussed this, so therefore we're, we're done, isn't isn't being open to this very specific proposal, very very specific content that was brought by these new parties. I mean, I, I, yes, we have discussed the, the, the generalities of a dual accreditation or a refined accreditation in the past. So then, just just one point: is it possible that we can have that side by side comparison available to us? Because I do believe that we've debated several of these items in the past i don't have access to that today i didn't think to bring it either. yeah and we we are at risk of debating what we've already debated to a considerable extent you're absolutely correct okay so mindy no i just i and it going to that and in, and I didn't bring it either, and I did not go through it line by line compared to those. But I remember back when we did have the debate, I want to say there were 56 items that LTAC as a whole had a majority vote for that, yes, we thought were things worth looking at and changing. Of those 56, and I'm, I, I may have had the number wrong, but I think it's, yeah, somewhere around there. And of that, it was only two that ELAP had agreed were worthy of changing and went for. But LTAC as a whole had the majority vote on at least 50 of them. So I, and again, I have not compared them identical. So I'm in my mind from what I've seen, I, I'm pretty sure those are very similar to ones that yes, we have all debated on and we agreed on the majority of them. And so it was with um, the agency partners, I think that it got it changed back. So I think that's where the difference is. And so I don't think we need to re debate all of it kind of is, I mean, that was just my understanding of it. Uh, Steve, when when the time comes, I'll I'll get in queue down here. Yeah, so I think we've just got we're all, we've got one more comment up here. At least, at least eager comment. My apologies. Steve, like to so one one more comment up here, I think, unless yeah. Christine also has one, and then we'll go down to Southern California. So we're we're all kind of discussing the strategies of our discussion right now, which is appropriate. <laughs> so Bruce Labelle, go ahead. Yeah, I guess yeah. Part of it uh, is. We did want you know, a lot of work on a previous, you know, call it, propose, you're discussing, you know, deviations or options. I appreciate people actually bringing these other ones forward. It's sort of a question of how to present them because they bring this one that's been on six months from now. There's another group bringing forward another proposal six months after that for the next 20 years. Uh, so what is the process? One process is discussing this or whatever future ones come every six months or year, or do we, you know, another option is move forward with the reg process as part of the, since it's TNI based as well, these changes that are being suggested, have them as part of the regulatory process. People are certainly open to uh, presenting, you know, information as part of the regulatory process if they believe that this part of the regulations that, Chris, you know, that ELAF is proposing should be modified for this reason or is inappropriate for this reason, should be omitted for this reason. That's the other, another potential thing to can think about. Sure, so maybe Christine sure. can comment on that and we'll go down to Southern California. So we, we have a package to propose <coughs> and we'll release it next week. And we have the plan to have the public hearing and the public workshop in the spring. And so, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, there are some criteria that have to be met for ELAP to support an alternative proposal. So I guess the real question for you all is you need to review the alternative to see if one, it doesn't have a dual track because we won't support it. 
and we've been clear for a long time that it has quality management system philosophy in it with details that's enforceable and auditable. That we don't just get a split vote where I have to go to the board members and to the agency partners and say they can't decide again, they're split. It has to be near unanimous or consensus where it helps me fight for you and say this is what the community really wants because we have our other advisory committee that says they want T&I. Um, and then we are on the path. The board members and the agency partners want a regulation package. If you look at the timeline that we've given before, the regulations won't be in effect fully until 2023. So they're waiting a long time and they're worried. So if you're going to ask, you know, for us to keep doing this, it's not going to be six months. It's, we're going to have to get something if it meets these criteria <coughs> before we go to the board in the spring. So that's really what this group has to decide. I don't think the details, I think it's if you want to move forward with that as a group to gain the support of the program before we take it to the board. Okay, so Southern California. David here. So um, I would not support LTAC forming a subcommittee to look at this. Uh, the board has directed ELAB to move forward with writing regulations. So whatever, you know, by the time this committee met and came up with some recommendations, it would be springtime, at which point ELAP is planning to have their draft regulations ready to go to OAL, if not before the board. So there's not going to be sufficient time for this community to meet and do anything useful that would produce a result that would be satisfactory to anybody. Rather, what I would suggest, what I would recommend to the group is that we request the state board have a hearing or a workshop or however that gets worded to discuss this uh, issue. Uh, and I think that's what's really important. Uh, that would be a far more expeditious approach. So that's my that's my feeling. Hey, David. We've got a lot of background noise. Is that the court next door or the rest of the Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a wild bunch over there. Um, I, they have their own judge, and we, so we have no authority over them. The court's over there. The party's over there. Ah, okay. It's actually another group. Apparently, they're around two sides. Yeah. Uh, court on one side, and who knows what the other group is. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a party. We don't really know. Okay. Whoever else is very lively. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I, this is Andrew. I'm going to go talk to uh, the building management and see if we can and figure this out somehow. Hey, Andrew, it, it's functional. Um, you know, we just we're here as long as the speaker has the mic up to them. We've got a meeting for another hour, an hour or two, maybe more if we have to go over. So I wouldn't bother at this point going to building management. Yeah, Miriam just walked over and asked them to, to quiet it down a little bit. So I think they're they're complying. She must have been forceful. Dead <laughs> silent. <laughs> other other comments or suggestions in Southern California. So David's proposed, uh, you know, that we solicit the state board to hold a workshop on the subject matter. Are there others? So this is Ron Cox. Um, so I'm in opposition to David on this. Uh, I think that uh, I would recommend that we form a subcommittee, but I would also recommend that ELAB uh, move forward with um, accepting for reciprocity the full T&I standard. And then have the subcommittee go back to the original LTAC recommendations to changes to T&I and make that their starting point for coming forward with new regulations, but it's got to be quick. So can I seek a clarification? So I want to make sure I was clear because reciprocity is one thing, but then there is what would be the standard for the labs that weren't operating under TNI? Like my lab's a TNI lab right now. So, are you talking about existing TNI labs or adopting, moving forward with the current with the draft regs as we've kind of currently seen them with mostly TNI minus those two things in the interim as this other process continues to discuss this parallel accreditation? So, I would actually uh, say that full TNI would be the standard by which labs would be accredited in the interim until these new standards are developed. Uh, so. Thank you. Any other 
suggestions or comments in Southern California? Um, my opinion is that um, we, we've been through this process. Who is this? Oh, this is Rich. Sorry. Right, thanks, Rich. Uh, we've been through this process. We spent a, quite a bit of time actually uh, paring down TNI to what we all agreed by consensus with. Uh, and so if I wanted to see anything, um, I would prefer to see uh, ELAP reconsider that version instead of trying to write a whole new version. Anyone else? Okay, so let me throw out kind of the Robert's Rules of Order concept, right? We can continue to have discussions, debate. There can also be motions on a couple of these different things that were uh, just suggested in Southern California and potentially feel the same up here in Northern California for some. Motions require a second, and then we go to vote. And so um, we can go through that approach as well. Um, but ultimately, we've got a, a recommendation from uh, the parties that presented for us to consider dual accreditation. We understand where uh, uh, Christine uh, falls on that subject matter. Um, also that she's seeking consensus from us or near consensus to make it easier to justify uh, contrast potentially to state agency partners or to her executive management. We've got a recommendation um, to consider uh, not moving forward with the work group, uh, but having a recommendation for a board workshop. And then um, Ron's recommendation to move forward with our existing process and then seek to schedule opportunities to discuss this further. Kind of like what Bruce was saying, I think this is what you were saying, Bruce, is move forward what we're moving forward with now, and then these other opportunities come forward and discuss to determine if that could be further change of the program in the future, I think is what you suggested. During the comment period, too, right, during the public comment period. Mindy. I'm sorry. I just want to add one additional thought on this is that, you know, one of the speakers was, oh, there's a few loud-spoken labs that do not want this. And I think really we need to key on, on in on the fact that, yes, there's a few speakers that people are hearing over and over again, but these are speakers that represent large groups of labs. Um, as well. I mean, it's between SCAP and CASA and, I mean, all the CWEA, Civicwa, BACWA, these are, it's a very large number of labs that ha are having an issue with where it's at now. And so I, I just kind of want to make sure that that's emphasized, that it's not a few loudmouths that are here that just say they don't want to do it in their lab. And it's never been about not wanting to do it. It's about justifying the cost for the benefit of doing it and having that, you know, proven that it is something that the, the municipal labs can support. Um, so again, that's where I think, you know, I would say, yeah, going back to that original list of items that LTAC had agreed upon um, and working with that, whether it's a subcommittee or, you know, having, you know, Christine and Jacob go back over that list and seeing if there is anything else on that one. But, you know, definitely I think there's people that would be willing to work with you on that. Uh, Steve, that's one of the second Mindy's comments. Uh, the Coalition of Accredited Laboratories has commented on this a number of times. And if you see the signature list, we have 140 signatures with 150, representing 150 labs. So that includes privately owned labs as well as publicly owned labs, large and small labs. So this is not a large versus small lab issue. This is not a public lab versus private lab issue. <laughs> labs of all sorts, of all sizes, have concerns about this. That's all I want to add. Thank you, David. Uh, Allison has a comment. So that, interestingly enough, um, when I looked at the meeting packet, uh, I was, I, found that one of the first slides, actually in slide number five, was somewhat disingenuous um, uh, regarding the perceived value of NELAP and the primary purpose being interstate commerce. And of course, um, you know, I'm an example of how that is not true, or my lab is, I should say, and uh, my participation here is a perfect example of how that's not true. Uh, Babcock Laboratories uh, was an early adopter of NELAP. Uh, 
basically because we felt that it was it pre it gave us a proper laboratory accreditation standard a proper standard to live up to but also um, because there was some perceived value in being able to have that as a laboratory that you had that you had a more rigorous more well documented system that you were operating under now Babcock laboratories does not do business outside of California interstate commerce has very little to do with it interstate commerce has very little to do with the bulk of the work that performed by other laboratories like BSK like WEC laboratories these definitely are names known to most of the people in this room um, and some of the other early adopters uh, the old Del Mar laboratory they still exist of course but they're not Del Mar anymore all of us adopted this uh, program not necessarily for interstate commerce but because we believed that it was the way that we wanted to do business going forward business as environmental laboratories the other the other point that I'd like to make while I still have the mic here um, is that we had to go outside of California to get NELAP accreditation after California uh, stopped providing it uh, because we became more and more concerned and aware and we were already concerned before California no longer offered NELAP but we definitely after California pulled out of the, the, the TNI program we definitely knew that the ELAP program was a complete and utter mess and that nobody had any faith in laboratory including the laboratory accreditation provided by ELAP wasn't worth the paper it was written on and in order to be able to present yourself as a qualified laboratory you had to have NELAP accreditation Many municipalities require still in their contracts that you have NELAP labs or that you be a NELAP lab in order to bid on their work, in order to provide them with, 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 with uh, environmental services. Why? Because the people that they're reporting to and the risk tolerance that they're willing to make or take has to take that into account. So, I mean, I'm looking at at Bruce, but he knows what I'm talking about. The regulatory partners were reached a point where ELAP accreditation wasn't worth anything. And ELAP, since it's come over to the state board, is still a very weak, weak program. I don't think that taking the, I, you talk about wasting money, oh my goodness we will be wasting a huge amount of public agency and state dollars producing a second uh, another standard for what purpose because individuals are afraid or or concerned that they don't have the resources in their public agency i don't believe i believe that's fear and it isn't founded in reality we already heard about examples in texas during, during the, the discovery phase uh, with the expert review panel. Once again, I don't believe, I don't, I just think that it would be very, very, um, I feel very strongly about this. I think this would be a poor use of resources to go trying to create a whole new situation that's only California based. Uh, I've got three here, two or two to three here more in Northern California, and then we'll go down to Southern California so we don't continue to go around the table here. Um, so we've got Diane and Gail and Bruce. I'm not sure if you were interested in Bruce. Gail, I'm sorry, Diane, Gail, then Bruce, and then we'll go down to Southern California. Two years ago when we went through this, I actually was not on the board. I was sitting where Bill is. So I was on the periphery, but it's my understanding that ELAP took LTAC's recommendations 
to the board and the recommendations were the 57 that we agreed, that LTAC agreed on. The board said, thanks, but no thanks. We want to go with TNI with these few. Is that correct, Christine? We did take that summary to the board and mm -hmm. they, they supported the two modifications and to include TNI by reference in a California regulation standard. Okay, that being the case, I'm getting head shakes, but the, I, the history, you know, that's what, that was my understanding. Now, if we try that again, we're going to be in the same boat, I believe. I also agree with everything that Allison said. One thing that I'm finding it very difficult to comprehend are the costs that I've heard associated with going to the TNI standards. Uh, the EPA Office of Water is the only EPA office that requires the states to have accredited auditors go out to the states. And I was, I actually had the privilege two years to be an instructor for those uh, state personnel who would go out and audit the laboratories. So I do have some uh, experience in teaching this sort of thing. I understand that ACIL has volunteered some of its members to go and help some of the smaller laboratories. I personally would be thrilled to do that. If, if it's not insurmountable, it, it can be done. And there are volunteers who would help these laboratories with it. And I personally would like to see the TNI standards remain as, as we as had been proposed by the board, and I would like to volunteer my time to help laboratories who need standard operating procedures, documentation, document control. There are individuals out there that will help. This is my state. I want to be proud of everything that's out there, and I wouldn't mind being a part of it. Okay, so this is Stephen. Just thank you. I, I want to chime in a little bit for why we're even discussing this today. So when we had the board meeting, when uh, Chair and Christine and uh, NV5 and Bruce presented to the board, and then there was public comment, several board members expressed either confusion dependent upon who they were talking to in terms of whether you know they were convinced that TNI was was warranted or they'd speak to others and convinced that maybe a different system was warranted and one specific board member who's not there anymore specifically asked for the parties to work with ELAP and come forward with what a they called a dual I think it was board member Moore a dual accreditation system would look like so by default um, that opened the door for further discussion and consideration of the subject matter and the presentations that were brought forward to us. So our task is to engage on that, really take the direction from the board members of, well, what would this be, even though something was presented to them as, as an option uh, for, for us to figure out, you know, where we fit in this now, given that further dialogue. So uh, this isn't something where Christine or myself came forward and said, we want to re rehash the discussion from the past. It's something new that was brought forward, maybe, parallel in a lot of circumstances and maybe 80 percent, 20 percent, whatever it is. I haven't gone through the details side by side and we're discussing this now for that context. It's direction from the board to the public to work with ELAP and by default LTAC. So uh, Gail and then Bruce. Okay, this is more of a comment or an observation. Um, um, and given that Amber's presentation, excellent by the way, um, is still a first draft. One of the things that jumped out at me was that the elements that you highlighted aren't that much different from TNI. I think every lab that is reputable would agree that all of those elements are part of their QA program. What's in dispute is how or in how much paperwork you use to document it. So for myself, I would have concerns if the checklist used to audit me 
was the same sort of checklist that's been used to audit someplace like Eurofins or Test America, because I would not have the, res the sorts of resources to keep that kind of paperwork that they would. I might be combining elements. I might be doing it in a different order. That's what's in the in the TNI standard, but it's there, and I'd want I'd want an auditing program that takes that into account. The types of resources that for the laboratory that you're auditing, and do they meet the the intent and the presence of the element? So that's my only thing. I don't think anybody here disagrees that those things that are listed are important. They probably already do it, just in different in different degrees. So um, the policy for HR, all I did was I referenced the state's policy manual. Um, for for purchasing, all I did was you know reference the state's assessment manual. And you know if you want if the auditor wants to look at it, I'm going to give them the link to go look for it. But if you're expecting that there's going to be a full-blown policy written and available on site for an auditor, go through and describe how do I purchase something, then I don't think that's fair for smaller labs. My two cents worth. Bruce? Uh, just a moment of history is I guess the <clears throat> NELAP goes back to mid-1990s discussion with multiple stakeholders across the country, as uh, Bill mentioned. Uh, in 1997, Cal EPA report recommended uh, NELAC, NELAP at the time, TNI standard, the, uh, and it actually recommended a multi-year, I think, I think it would recommend actually some of the documents say, taking some years to make the transition. I think back then it was recognized that, especially for small and municipal labs, but also commercial labs, it's a huge lift to go from where they are today with very limited resources to try and address the standards of uh, what's now TNI. One reason why I think there's a value to an established standards is in the established elements, unless someone can really explain really clearly why they don't apply, is <clears throat> they've had, since the mid-1990s, uh, lots and lots of input and feedback and then real-world testing, and then up to, you know, trials, com more comments, what did and didn't work, and that became 2003, 2009, now 2016. So there's a lot of uh, interpretation and feedback and adjustment. And <clears throat> you know, taking saying something's going to be pulled out without thinking about all of that is a, you know, doesn't seem to make sense. Someone would have to really look through the entire history of each section that might be modified or removed. That doesn't mean that it's not, you know, just push it right ahead onto these labs without thinking about the impact on them. The administrative you know, work how is really a key thing is how do we minimize the cost, and both cost in terms of dollars as well as people. And a lot of that comes into, as uh, you mentioned, how do we find ways of making it very simple to comply and because some of the level of detail required is commensurate with the types of work. A drinking water lab that has simple tests, tests don't vary over from year to year. So a lot of the measure, metrics can be, or requirements can be achieved much more simply than a lab that's doing multiple complex analyses that, where the methods themselves may change over time. So that should be taken into account. And ideally, we'd want to have two things. One is, how do we help labs comply in a simple way, not simply here's templates that work for a huge lab and you're supposed to be able to interpret them, but really focus them on these small municipal labs. And another aspect is really, ELAP is not ready to do a full assessment because if they don't really understand what is acceptable, then they may look at boilerplate and say, you don't have this in this form and not realize it's being covered elsewhere. The lab itself doesn't re isn't sophisticated enough yet to realize, no, no, we covered over here in this other document that's or referenced in this other thing. So I, that's, again, a reason why I wanted to have time so that the ELAP assessors can work with the labs and effect, work together on how do we make sure we're complying. As assessors, how do we make sure you understand what you need to do and we're not going to go overboard? How do you make sure you meet all the requirements for multiple times before you're held either to do this or you're risking losing your accreditation or having to spend a lot of money quickly. 
So that's my feeling about why I've said, let's move ahead. But if during the regulatory process, someone really can explain why some sections are not needed, some documentation, then you know, that's something that, again, ELAP's explaining why it's needed, if there's an international standard. And if someone can say, no, no, that's not needed because of X, that's a logical thing to be doing. Just see something to consider, but I really want to make sure we have ways of helping the small labs with as much as we can with templates, uh, training, experts coming in in simple ways, not simply coming in like a large lab would do it. Stephen, at the moment, I'll get in queue. Yes, so we finished up here with the three parties that had comments. Allison, I've got to get down to Southern California uh, out of balance to them since I can't see them on the screen and see how many hands are up. So let's go down to Southern California and um, just a just time check. Uh, it's 10 to 2 and we had projected 2.30 and I don't think we're going to be done at 2.30, so just be, be prepared for that. Uh, so Southern California. Steven, uh, this is Andrew real quick. Can I just uh, take a uh, kind of a survey to see who's, who wants to respond and then I can point to them so it's a little smoother? That would be fantastic. Thank okay, you. Okay, so we got David, S, Hoi, Hoi will uh, go, and then uh, Ron Koss. Is there any other LTAC members? Yeah, I'd like to speak Sean will go fourth. And then I'll go. Okay. Brown. You got everybody. I got everybody. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's appropriate. Thank you. Yep. And I'll start with David. Okay. Very briefly, uh, there was a lot of questions about costs. Because really, at the end of the day, the debate is, are all these additional bookkeeping and record keeping requirements in TNI, you know, produce any benefits that outweigh, outweigh the costs? And I'll just throw in that the quality of the data is determined by the methods, not the record keeping. So, so long as everyone's using the right methods, and appropriately, that's where the quality comes from, not record keeping. Now, in terms of cost, everyone's saying, well, it's too costly or it's not costly enough. Well, if you, ELAP ran a dual program for almost 20 years. So obviously, it is one doable and has been done. Now, the, I think the key element here when we're talking about cost is when ELAP provided dual accreditation, the fees for the, not for the TNI were three times higher than they were for non-TNI. Now, where did those numbers come from? Well, in 2001, or actually in 2000, it was ultimately adopted in 2001, they proposed a fee regulation. It's R-70-00E, um, where they explained, you know, why we're going to adopt TNI, why we're going to, you know, do this. And they explained why the fees were so much higher, three times higher. They said because they had actually already done a number of on-site assessments and calculated the cost that would take them three times as much work to do an on-site assessment using TI as opposed to the conventional approach. And if I'll, I'll read just a little bit. So the, this is, I'm quoting from ELAPS regulations. This is written by ELAPS staff at the time. The costs range for on-site assessments ranged from $10,000 for a small lab to a large lab of over $50,000. Now, this is, an, this is, an, this is on, in year $2,000, not 20 years later. So the corresponding fees for the two laboratories are $4,000 for the smaller and $25,900 for the larger. So they had actually gone out and done on-site assessments using T uh, the NELAP at a ton and calculated it took them three times as much work with all these dollar amounts associated with it. So it takes them three times as much work, it costs us, takes us three times as much work, and costs us a lot of money too. So. That's the dollar side of it. Anyone wants to see a copy of this? It's from the initial statement of reasons. Uh, I can share that with anyone. But so it's not like people are imagining that this is going to be a lot more expensive. We have documentation from ELAP staff based on their experiences that it is a lot more expensive. We uh, this is Toy from LACSB. You know I. <clears throat> In preparing for this, uh, in preparing for this meeting, I actually spent quite a bit of time reviewing the proposal from Amber. And you know, I, by the way, I thought that was a pretty decent first draft uh, proposal. And you know, I thought, you know what? But it's it's kind of similar to what we've been discussing. And I, I know some of the members already said this that it, it looks as if this is something that we did two years ago. You know, we proposed 50 plus, or maybe I, I thought maybe even. 80 modifications. 
and we ended up with only two that were approved by the, uh, you know, by ELAP and, and the state water board. And why are we doing this again? But, you know, the more I thought about it, I mean, I, I, I think that back then, two years ago, that was something new for a lot of the, you know, public laboratories. They heard about TNI. They didn't really understand that much about it. You know, two years later, we've gotten training from Bill Ray. We've got training from, you know, other uh, uh, agency. We've got training from TNI. And, and a lot of these labs now realize that, you know what, it's going to be tough for us to implement something like this. It's going to cost us a lot. And so I think it's worth it for us to really spend time and reconsider this again, take a look at it again, and, and, and as a committee, you know, uh, maybe come up with something that, that is workable for the whole laboratory community. You know, we, we, we've done this before, but we've now got, I believe, more knowledge about the process, more, more knowledge about what we are dealing with. And I think it's really worth, uh, you know, worth it for the committee to reconsider it and, 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 you know, have a discussion about this again. That's just my two cents. Okay. Um, well, this is Ron Koss, and I'm, of course, agreeing and disagreeing all across the board. <clears throat> but let me, let me just start by paraphrasing something that uh, Bill had mentioned in his presentation. The TNI claims to provide data of known and documented quality. I would argue that it actually does provide data of known and documented quality. Quality systems don't dictate the quality of the data, they simply document the quality of data. Um, <clears throat> I, I do think that that's worthwhile, and I do think that it's worth the additional expense. However, um, I think that, that uh, we need to keep into perspective the, uh, the certified laboratory uh, group and the small labs they do have to, um, a, an appropriate perspective on this. Um, so I do, I, I, I would recommend that LTAC take this up as a subcommittee based on the recommendations that LTAC made two years ago, those 50 to 80 recommendations that were then cast aside and come up with something that would be more palatable for the small lab community, perhaps a little more streamlined, retaining the key elements of the TNI system. I would, I would strongly urge that whatever recommendation the subcommittee comes back with be based upon the TNI standards. So it's my comment, and it's also my recommendation or um, suggestion for the committee to create the subcommittee. Okay. This is Sean from Division of Drinking Water, and you know I'm relatively new to LTAC. I've only, this is my third meeting now, so I don't have the history of the previous discussions over the last several years of TNI and what elements you wanted to keep, what elements you wanted to throw out. So I just want to give my perspective as I'm reading this dual accreditation proposal as a state agency who uses the data that you all produce. Um, I think this dual track, this dual accreditation, whatever you call it, ultimately ends up weakening our data set that we're using for our business needs, where we have one set of labs doing TNI, full implementation of TNI, and another set of labs doing a partial implementation of TNI, lack of internal controls, deciding and documentation what not to include. I think it adds a, variable, a new variable into our data set of which lab produced the data. And ultimately, that just weakens the quality of the data set. It makes it less defensible for our business purposes, our decision making when we're establishing new MCLs, looking at economic feasibility of new MCLs, or even just the capabilities of DLRs. And I think really that's why you know we're supporting ELAP with this accreditation of a single quality uh, system for the lab suit. Okay. Uh, this is Brad um, standing in for Bruce. I think that the the notion of the and I'll, I will use the term the parallel accreditation or parallel track I think is um, born out of the notion that uh, portions of the TNI standard have no bearing or or you know positive impact or material impact on data accuracy precision reliability, defensibility, and so forth. And 
So using, uh, I think, Bruce LaBelle's sort of approach on some things, I want to read a couple things back here slightly, you know, with it maybe a, a slightly different lens here. So just a couple of excerpts. So uh, having arrangements to ensure, and this is from the management requirements, which I believe is one of the standards citations that was eliminated from what was being proposed as part of this, of this parallel track. So uh, having arrangements to ensure that its management and personnel are free from any undue internal and external com commercial, financial, and other pressures and influences uh, that may affect quality of the work has no bearing on data quality, accuracy, precision, reliability, defensibility. Um, Having rele uh, relevant SOPs uh, readily accessible to all personnel has no bearing on reliability, defensibility, traceability, et cetera. SOPs uh, not indicating the effective date of the document with a revision number and signatures of an approving authority has no bearing on data, integrity, defensibility, reliability, et cetera. So, you know, three small examples, and I don't, I don't want to go through every single one. Um, for anybody that's ever had to um, defend their data to real scrutiny would know that it's not always just about the number being generated. It's about your ability to prove that that was done within the precision and accuracy of the method, and you can dictate and, and identify all the things that went in and contributed to that particular number. So the number may be right, it may be wrong, but you better well be able to prove that. And that is one of the main things that this notion of documentation is about. And the documentation is just evidentiary. It's that you have a process, it's that you have a procedure to be able to demonstrate that and to defend that. Having gone through uh, the, you know, the NELAC standard and implemented it in, in both large and small labs and maintaining it in large and small labs, I understand it looks like a very heavy lift and there's a big thick document and it's real scary and so forth. Um, but that was 20 years ago when we started this and, and I don't know the exact dates and times and so forth, but the, the knowledge base and the resources that are available and the more practical ways that this can be implemented nowadays, there is by far more expertise out there to help people with this. And I think it was, I think it was Gail up in, in Sacramento there, I believe, said how there was a reference back to the, uh, the state or maybe the county's purchasing department or the local, uh, you know, the, the agency's human resource department on how you deal with this these types of things, that is exactly how people would approach this. You don't have to hire an HR department, and you don't have to necessarily have a new purchasing department in your laboratory. There are ways to practically deal with these things. And from my perspective, having running a, a, a TNI based laboratory right now of 85 people, I can assure you that the implementation of TNI in a laboratory that has five test methods over three FOTs is by far an easier, less arduous lift than to do so in a, larger, in a larger organization. So while I may have additional resources to be able to do it, the speed of which you can do this and the practicality and the, uh, the ability to get people on board is by far easier when you're dealing with three people as opposed to 85. Okay? The inter the international, you know, the, the TNI standard, it's a consensus-based standard based on ISO 17025, the gold standard in the international community for calibration and testing labs. This is well vetted, and it's well established, and it's been thought out by, uh, you know, the consensus standard body process is, uh, brings in all stakeholders, data users, consumers of it, the people generating it. So concerns have been heard, and this is, we're 20 years into the NELAC program. This has got, this is, has become a pretty good document. So, you know, my recommendation or my, my vote, if I was to get a vote on this, is that the parallel system, while I appreciate the, the reasons for it, I don't think that the, the cost concerns um, outweigh the benefits that go along with the full-blown TNI standard because, once again, it's not just about the number. There's a lot more to the work that we do than just that single result. Is, is there anyone else from Southern California? I'll get back in the queue. Uh, we'll probably go back north. Yeah, uh, Stephen, 
that was one round that went through. Uh, how do you want to proceed? Well, I've got a couple people up here. I'm, I'm, what I'm hoping is that we don't rehash, much like I asked the public speakers, if they made a comment and you're in agreement, there's no need to rehash. Um, you know, we've been, we've been at this rodeo before. So uh, if you're bringing something new to add, please do so. Uh, and I'm going to defer to my right. I'm going to go counterclockwise since Andy's right next to me. Jim, because E comes before M. So, <laughs> um, just to comment, I'm part of a National Academy of Sciences group that's been looking at the quality system that the USGS is applying because they had a little problem back in 2015 that had actually been going on for about 10 years with inappropriate practices. And they called in the National Academy of Sciences to try to help them put a quality system into place. And what we are doing as a National Academy work group is basically saying, okay, here's what you need. And what we're focusing on is how can you the 400 odd labs within the USGS, which range from one person to the water quality lab at 150, figure out how to implement the parts of a quality system, not how can you have a different quality system for the National Water Quality Lab versus what you have for an R&D lab, but instead, what are the ways to make it easy to implement? And that's sort of the same thing that Gail was talking about in terms of procurement policy, et cetera. So I think, you know, there are ways to make it easy to move forward with the existing reg or the existing proposed reg, however it may look now, and then just focus on the training aspects to figure out how to make it work. Go to Mark, and then Mindy. Can I skip you, Jill, or do you have? Okay, and then Anthony. A a almost everybody up here, I think, has a question or a comment. So we're just going to go around the table. You're welcome to comment, Jill. I was just joking. So um, one of the things uh, Christine asked us for was uh, consensus, and we had had that discussion a couple of years ago about elements that we felt should be included in the standard and those that should not. Some of it. Um, was accepted and some of it was not. And I think that in, in an effort to uh, not lose, you know, we talk about known and, and documented data quality. In an effort to f focus on documented data quality, I don't want to lose the known aspect of that. And I think um, some of these elements that have been highlighted by this parallel standard have uh, been an effort to try and take away some of that excessive documentation to focus more on the known do, uh, data. Um, I think it might be worthwhile re-looking at some of those elements that we had come into consensus with where we said, you know, this probably isn't worthwhile keeping in the standard. Um, the other idea that, um, as I was uh, listening to everybody talk about this, is was a lot of this is focused on small labs and their ability to implement it, particularly as it relates to documentation and how to uh, address some of these issues. Um, I think it might be worthwhile considering uh, we've, we've been talking about a three-year implementation period, um, putting in perhaps some sort of variability for smaller labs to bring this in over maybe even a instead of a three-year, maybe a five-year. Uh, and there are other types of permits. Uh, we've, we've dealt with nutrient permits and th those types that have uh, looked at um, extended periods of, of addressing concerns. Um, you know, I, I like the parallel standard that was presented, but there are some concerns that I have with it, like uh, the corrective actions, you know. I believe that corrective actions is a necessity for any good lab out there. Um, but I don't want to, in an effort 
to force documentation lose the quality of those labs that are doing good work out there. This is Mindy. Um, I just want to say that I, I think that having a work group with this first draft of the QMS that was put forward today, really having some people add in and go through it to make sure, because I, I, the QMS critical elements that Christine you know, presented up there, I think all of us agree with. We all think they are very critical. We want them for data quality. And yeah, a lot of our labs that are not even close to TNI certified right now are, feel that we are doing these. We're trying our best to do these. Um, so I think that this is definitely, as kind of as Mark said, not trying to rehash the same thing, but um, you know, this is something that I think going back to our list, I, working strongly with ELAP, and even if, again, it's, LTAC members, but also a work group, if you have somebody else, the people who, you know, Amber or Bill, who have been working on this, who, you know, know, you know, how they see this fitting in, in the public, you know, would be a good idea. One question, I mean, I had, and it was kind of the, Allison brought it up, and even Brad brought it up is, um, and actually I think Bruce brought it up also, is, you know, the full T&I and... No offense at all to ELAP, but you know, saying that you know that their paper is kind of meaningless right now for a sense. But even with their version of the standard that's coming out, even though it's close to TNI, it's not full TNI. It's California. We still need to, as Bruce said, go through the time to let ELAP continue to strengthen their program to get up to it. So even if they strengthen their program, and we have a paralleled system that is phased down a little bit. The, it's still better than the previous program that, that, you know, or standard that we had. And if ELAP has trained qualified staff that are holding people accountable to that, the increase in data quality and the believability for you know, the agencies, the agency partners of the data, it's gonna be proven that you know, though it is quality work. We're following the methods. We just don't have all that extra documentation that we don't really feel, because we, I mean, a lot of these agency groups have so, other than just doing the lab work, things that, you know, some of the commercial labs don't even deal with with our jobs as far as working with our permits and other things that we're trying to do in our position that takes time away. It is, you know, it, it's not, for a lot of the agencies, it's not a full-time job just to run a lab. I mean, even though, you, you know, it, it's a big part of the job. So just keeping that in mind, I just wanted to make sure, but you know, the, you understand that, yeah, it already is gonna be two different systems anyway, because we have the full TNI labs. So I don't know if that made sense. But. Jill? Um, I just, I was actually like totally shocked that we were gonna have this meeting because I, and I called Steven, like, where's this coming from? Um, so I, I just want to express a concern for wasting time, for wasting ELAP's time, LTAC's time, and other laboratories' time. Just I'm kind of wondering what, what would change the board member's mind? What, what could we possibly present that would change the board member's mind? And I understand that there's a few new board members, so maybe simply being new people it would change their mind. Um, that being said, I hear what you're saying, Christine, that you will not support a dual system, and and I, I'm not advocating for that either. So I think for my support, this subcommittee, this a work group to be formed for this draft proposal, I would only support it if it was gonna be applicable to all ELAP labs. It couldn't be applicable to just public utility labs. Um, and so I just wanna be like, I just want to be mindful of everybody's time so that we're not wasting more time developing this and working on it, taking it to the board for just to be shot down again and disappointing the agency partners. And, and this is Stephen, if I can chime in, we have no idea what the board members, were they entertaining just getting more detail? Would it shift their opinion? Yeah, you know, that's, they, they did not divulge that. They just indicated, a couple of them indicated they'd be interested in learning more. So we have no idea uh, to answer that first question you had or first comment you had. Uh, Anthony, thank you. Yeah, um, th and thank you. Um, I'll try to be brief because I think my voice is going. But it, anyway, just a different perspective. I represent uh, 
approximately 30 public health laboratories across the state. And those laboratories are, are similar to uh, municipal laboratories in size because you have uh, two or three person labs and then you have uh, 60 person labs. But one thing that makes us different is that we are uh, by state uh, requirement under CLIA, the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment, I hope I got that right, of 88, uh, which has regulations that are, are, are uh, well, to say quite a few regulations that TNI pretty much reflects, and that's fine. Uh, some of the laboratories are also under um, the CDC regulation called the uh, their division of select agents and toxins. These are the antibioterrorism groups of which we happen to be one for a while. What that means uh, with their quality management systems and regulations, they're all quite similar, but the challenge that we face is each agency wanted those same elements in their format. And that made it a big challenge. So the I, I think in what I the what I'm hearing from the public health laboratories as I've been discussing our meetings at their uh, at their subcommittee meetings and at our uh, annual meeting, which I gave uh, an annual update. Uh, it's not so much whether we go to TNI or some other kind of uh, um, method. Uh, what they're concerned with and what would be very, very helpful is some way of being able to, as mentioned by some of the other speakers, to reference uh, some of those same elements. Because if it has to be in a particular format for a particular inspector to accept, that's what makes it very challenging. So just in any two-year period, I'm inspected by um, CLIA. Uh, we used to be inspected by ELAP, inspected by DSAT, inspected by the Office of Compliance for HIPAA issues, and inspected by the Tar Department of Transportation for transportation issues. All of those groups want their own format. That's what is a, a challenge here. So I just wanted to put that out as a perspective that there is a, there is a subgroup of laboratories, California Public Health Laboratories, uh, that we have to... Uh, abide by a lot of different regulations. No particular comment. I, I don't think any of my um, laboratories have expressed any particular one way or the other, but we all have that same burden of being able to have the same elements addressed, but in very particular formats for those agencies. Thank you. I've lost kind of where the podium goes. That's Bruce. Just very quickly, uh, one thing to keep in mind is <clears throat> when the discussion of, you know, changes is going beyond data quality, uh, the management component is in a sense more applicable perhaps to small labs because an example would be if you have a lab that has one, a lab manager is also lead chemist and has maybe one tech or a half-time tech or maybe two people it's one is it's really difficult for them to comply or get come into compliance and stay in compliance without staff. On the other hand, they want to take a vacation. If they're on vacation for two weeks or four weeks, if you don't have clear documentation of what the tech's allowed to do in their absence or when they're out at lunch, then there's potential that the quality will suffer. Uh, if you don't have it documented, maybe it won't suffer if you're really lucky, but how do you really know? For regulatory agency, drinking water division example, or DTSC, how do we know if, if there's, you know, someone doesn't have any system in place to ensure those things? Now, you, you probably all do have a system in place where what your tech's allowed to do and when you're out, out of the office. You comply probably. It just, you know, the key, key is how do we make it simple so you don't have to rewrite everything in a lot of detail in a format that makes it harder to comply. But you probably have all, much of what you need, if not all, already in place in your lab. You just don't realize it, and it's not in the listing in the order of this, so in, in that 100-page checklist, so it looks very difficult. It may not be as difficult as you think, but it still would take time. Uh, the other one is some of the components, when you read through them, some of them are being proposed to be omitted. I can picture a district manager, you know, district board, you go before them and they ask, uh, do you have a... 
uh, procedure for protecting the confidentiality of your data? I think most people would say yes, well, you comply with something that's being omitted. Why is it being omitted if it's something that of course you'd have? Things like that. Think in terms of if you were being asked, do you have that? You probably do. So, but again, it's the formatting is how you can do it in a simple way. Okay. Uh, oops, Renee. Thank you. Uh, three quick comments. Um, I believe some uh, two years ago, possibly, um, we did labs that were able to implement TNI. Um, um, obviously, you know, they it was modified to uh, our own laboratory, but I believe they were municipal labs as well, and um, it did take some time, but they managed to incorporate it in um, and were happy with the results. Uh, secondly, uh, we at the water boards do implement a quality system on various levels uh, for all of our environmental data collecting activities. We have uh, two quality assurance program plans, SWAMP and um, NPDES. We're working on a third beach monitoring, um, and uh, they follow the same outline, um, as well as at any one time 150 to 200 project plans that are currently uh, in play for environmental collecting data. And we've found that it just makes things work better. We have more comfort in the data. The samplers uh, know what they're doing. Um, it's just uh, a start to finish program. It doesn't ensure perfect data. Nothing does ensure perfect data. We know that. But if there's ever a question uh, or a concern, then uh, the labs, the samplers, water boards can go back and see what might have gone amiss or have more confidence in the data. And then Diane and Allison. And it's documentation that allows us to show that what we say we're doing, we are in fact doing. You can go back and you can reconstruct. It's uh, if one of the agencies had a lawsuit brought against them based on data that was turned in, that's really the only way you can go back and say, it, it could be wrong, but you could at least prove that that's what was done with the documentation that you have, and the documentation is from the top to the bottom, and I think it's really necessary. And all I was going to do <laughs> was, was to uh, remind everyone that TNI has a, a completely revised small laboratory handbook, and that it's intended to help explain the, regula the requirements of the 2016 standard and to provide environmental laboratories, especially small laboratories, with clear, simple guidance on how to develop the policies and procedures that will allow them to become accredited to the TNI standard. So, uh, the only other thing I was going to mention is Babcock Laboratories may have 85 individuals and uh, something like 17 FOTs. Does that sound reasonable? I think it's 17 FOTs. We have a staff of two full-time QA people, and we're NELAP accredited. Thank you. Okay, so I think we've rounded out the Northern California discussion, but I think we started, went down to Southern California and came back here, so out of fairness, uh, ignoring the time check that I just did, uh, are there any further comments in Southern California? Uh, let me, I'm sorry, David, let me just take a quick survey so I can organize this again. I think it was David and Ron uh, signed up before. Miriam, is there anyone else that would like to speak again? Okay, okay. We're, we're in order. So just real quickly, please stay on point with something new to add to the dialogue, if you can. Thank okay. you. Uh, this process really begins with the expert review panel, who were charged with trying to fix ELAP. ELAP wasn't working. I think no one, no, nobody disagrees with that. They weren't charged with fixing the labs. Nobody said, oh, the lab's doing a bad job. We need an expert review panel to fix that. And the expert review panel never said the lab's doing a bad job. And they didn't actually recommend TNI. And to the extent that a third, third party uh, set of standards were available, it was intended to fix ELAP, not fix labs. So everyone's starting with the assumption there's some problem with lab data. And in fact, no one has ever documented. 
So from the year 2000 to year 2014, ELAMP ran a two-track program. So we have 14 years of data, and nobody ever found a problem with the data in that period. No one said, oh, look, these non-TNI labs are doing a really bad job compared to the TNI labs. And all that data is still there. If anyone wants to go back and query the database and compare them, there's no difference. Uh, in terms of what the board members said, they actually did explain why they were concerned. Uh, Member Moore was saying that he was going to a lot of board meetings, and he was hearing at the board meeting the lab staff were saying, yeah, we're, if this goes through, we're going to have to shut our lab down. And he said, he repeated that he had been to these board hearings and heard staff saying this, and the board was saying, and their boards, and this is sanitation districts, this is, you know, uh, water districts, things like that, they were saying, yeah, we can't do this. And so he was concerned based on his own personal investigations at these meetings. Um, uh, and member Esquivel was concerned about uh, remote and poorly served communities. Uh, so, like, for example, in Trinity County, there's only one certified lab for all of Trinity County, and it is a sanitation district, but they do drinking water testing because there are no other labs in Trinity County. And they don't have even a single FTE committed to the lab. It's all operators working part-time. That lab will definitely close under this program. And there are other same situations. Uh, I-395, there are two, exactly two labs in that area. They serve a bunch of small communities that don't have access to any other labs. Uh, one, ha one lab is one person, the other lab is two people. Those labs will close or drop their accreditation, I think would be a better way to say that. And then uh, um, Member D'Amato was concerned uh, about the, the data that was presented as, uh, is this really a problem? Uh, there was a presentation by Mitzi Miller saying, oh, there's all these deficiencies, and she was wondering, well, let's look at those deficiencies. Are they really deficiencies? So there was actually some expression of concern about specific things that came from the board members. So I'll just close by saying, everyone's saying, well, we need SOPs. Well, current regulations require SOPs. All the things that people are saying, well, we really need, actually already exist. It's not like TNI is going to suddenly make people have SOPs when they didn't have SOPs before. Uh, and most of the cost of accreditation associated with TNI isn't the startup, it's the ongoing documentation. We saw that in Florida and New York, where TNI was required mandatory in year 2000, and lots of labs eventually dropped their accreditation. They, most of them got accredited under TNI. And then after they'd been doing it for a couple of years, then they dropped it, because the ongoing documentation was what drove them out. So I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Um, I'd just like to go back to um, assuring public health is really the critical role of quality data, and TNI does that through documentation, and so I think the TNI standard does a good job of that. Costs, fees, we have to pay with things. That's just the bottom line. Uh, both Florida and Texas saw labs go out of business after they adopted TNI and or drop accreditation, and that's just the way it is. However, within 10 years, they were back at the full same number of accredited laboratories. Small labs, isolated labs, regional labs may decide at some point that they don't want to pay the extra fee, but in reality, uh, they will pay what it takes to get the assurance that public health is being preserved. So I do think that we should push the fee argument to the back. I realize it's the big issue for small labs, but it is a secondary issue. The primary issue is, is assuring public health, and we do that through quality data. And TNI helps us get there. And so uh, the, there is a motion on the table to form a subcommittee, and I would ask that when the discussion is over, we, we take that vote. So this is Stephen, just out of my role as chair. There's been no formal motion. There have been I'm people that said they would they'd recommend or like to have a have a uh, have a work group is what we actually call it, not a subcommittee. So because of that, I have not asked if there was a second. Just I'm following uh, Robert's rules of order here. That's fine. I'm related to. So I'm sure we're going to get there after potentially the last comment in Southern California. Okay, so this is Miriam. I don't know. I might be the last comment. Um, so uh, my comment is about um, data quality. Um, and so-called substandard data quality that California labs are producing. <clears throat> There's actually nothing, no evidence, no data that backs that up. Right now, ELAP is um, 
fully um, stocked with enforcement personnel. And, you know, of the 700 labs that they audit, you know, a handful have been, you know, um, cited for some kind of violation. But for the most part, there is no data quality problem with California labs. And there's nothing to back that, that assertion up. That's all I have to say. Okay, Stephen, we're done uh, up here in Southern, or down here in Southern California. Okay, thank you. So we're at a point now, much like a handful of years ago, we've gone around the table multiple times, had discussion, debate, comments made. So it is 2.30. Um, we, you know, these meetings are over when they're over, so we can extend the meeting. But I think now is an appropriate time to ask if there are any motions that would like to be put forth to address either the uh, request from the presenters for a work group um, or anything else related to this subject matter, pro or con. So let's, uh, since there's a motion in a, su a, a prospect of a motion in Southern California, why don't we go ahead and start there? Thanks, Stephen. Um, I will make the motion that LTAC form a work group to create a tier of standards based on T&I. Uh, they, they be given a time frame to report back to the full committee that will allow us to move forward to the water board. Okay, so Jacob, did you write all that down? You got, I, I know you've got, you've got it recorded, right? Yeah. This is a recorded meeting, so. Yeah, poor, poor Jacob is taking Kate's responsibilities, who's uh, on maternity leave now. So a motion, in essence, to have a work group form to move forward and discuss this. What was the second component of that? Um, Is the TNI based? Year. Can we add anything to that motion so or not? So first, I believe we have to ask, is there a second? And in that second, we can discuss if there's any amendments to the motion. What was the second part? Timely. Timely manner. And TNI based. T and I based discussion pro minus plus, you know, type of thing. Okay, is there a second? Uh, this is why I second it. Okay, is there anybody that would like to recommend an amendment to that before we get to discussion or a vote? Yeah, David here. Well, hold on a second, Dave. I'm sorry, hold on. We've got legal counsel. I just want to make sure that you all understand that a subcommittee is still subject to Bagley Keen. Yeah, correct. When we get there, if it is in fact a, a majority, because we can form a subcommittee based upon majority, I don't think So it can only be two people. I mean, if you don't want to be subject to Bagley, Bagley Keen, only two people could be involved from LTAC. So I'd, I'd like to have a little discussion about that. I thought that Bagley Keene, we could not have a majority of LTAC members involved. So it would be a majority so minus if you're, one. So if you're having a subcommittee, if you're formally voting to put together a subcommittee, it is subject to Bagley Keene. No, I understand. But I believe Bagley Keene was less than a majority of the organization. You're saying two. I'm saying that um, if you have a subcommittee, if you formally vote to create a subcommittee, that subcommittee is subject to Bagley Keene unless it has less than two people on it. Oh, no, no. I, I, we understand it's subject to Bagley Keene, and Bagley Keene, we cannot have a majority of LTAC members participating. Otherwise, it becomes no. a violation of Bagley Keene. No. What about a work group, not a subcommittee? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it is then subject to, here, I'll, I will grab the statute for you, but it, um, <laughs> you're subject to Bagley Keene when you're <laughs> uh, <laughs> We're acknowledging that. What we're asking is the quantity of people because I believe all of our work groups are in violation if we're not allowed to have more than two. All yeah, of them. Two only applies to the board itself. You can, because have, you can have, okay, you can have more than two. If you have two or um, if you have two, then you're not subject to Bagley Keene. Right. I, oh, okay. I see your point. So you're basically saying if we have two or less, we're not subject to Bagley Keene. If we have more than two, we obviously can't have the majority, and then we're subject to Bagley Keene. Okay, so we're... Well, no, I think that's wrong. All of our work groups have more than two. We have private meetings outside of this that are not doing Bagley Keene public notification or anything right now. So are we in violation on every work group that we've had? But I think the difference is that you didn't make a vote to put together a work group. Yeah, we did. Yes, yeah. we did. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Fee work group, <laughs> GT work group. Everyone we have. Yeah. 
the, the limit of two only applies to the board itself because a quorum is three. So, so hold on, hold on. Okay. Let's. It's so, very important that we understand legal input here. So let's let's hear about this, and we'll go from there in terms of other amendments or. Yeah. So true. So any time that the LTAC, you know, if you guys are hanging out together and you have less than a quorum, it is not a um, a public meeting, and not subject to Bagley Keene, but. Section 11121 of the government code defines what a state body is. And it's an advisory board, advisory commission, advisory committee, advisory subcommittee, or similar multi-member advisory body of a state body if created by formal action of the state body or of any member of the state body. And if the advisory body so created consists of three or more persons. So if you create a, a subcommittee that has three or more, you're subject to Bagley Keene. And so that would mean we need to be publicly noticing our subgroup meetings, work group meetings? Okay, well, we've been woefully in violation of that from day one. <laughs> so, so moving forward, that doesn't affect this vote. If it gets to a vote, well, there's been a motion a second, but it means that we need to make sure we're working with, because an ELAP, st ELAP staff member participates in every work group. And so that would mean that we will need to make sure we are publicly noticing these because the public can also participate in these work groups. Are we all, are we in agreement? Is that, is that what you're saying? Okay, so pass is unfortunately the pass, but, but. No, no, I, I think it's very important that we rectify this now because from what you've told us, we've been in violation from day one of the Bagley Keene Act because none of our work group meetings have been publicly noticed that I'm aware of. So I wanna make sure we get that resolved today and then we can move forward with this discussion. And these were created by formal action of the Yes. Yes. You know, this, at the time we were told it was a quorum, we couldn't have a quorum. Having two people or less would get it. I don't, I'm, I'm not worried about the Bagley Keene Act. We just publicly notice it. So that's what we need to do moving forward is, is what I understand. More than for, well, for there to be a now. public, if, yeah, for your public meetings of LTAC. But when you have a subcommittee, this is saying that a subcommittee is subject to Bagley Keene. <coughs> okay, so we're all, we all understand that now. What, we, what would be helpful, I think, is for Christine to distribute to us if a work group meeting happens and you have more than two LTAC members participating, you need to do X. So if we can get that from you guys, yeah, not just could, saying you yeah, have to comply with Bagley Keene, we get that but what are the tasks we have to do to notify people of the meeting? And then we're, we're good moving forward, right? Everybody's puzzled. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we need Absolutely. feedback from, from ELAP and, and legal counsel to make sure that as we hold work group meetings, we are not violating Bagley Keene. So just saying you have to comply with Bagley Keene, we get it, but making sure we know what we need to do to comply would be very helpful. And I'm, I'm happy to put together something for you all and, you know, set out what all the requirements are and double check to make sure I'm not misinforming you, but also to give you options because there may be options that we could consider too that wouldn't require um, as much formal action. Thank you very much for interjecting on that because we want to comply with our obligations. From the narrow, we call them work groups, but they're consistent with a, a sub, a, a portion of us participating in activity. So work group subcommittee is inconsequential for compliance with that requirement. Okay. <sighs> now, there's been a motion. There was a second. There, there can be discussion now, and that discussion can be to suggest an amendment. So Jill already was kind of getting there, so why don't we go and have that now? So I would suggest that there be an emphasis on that the quality management system, work group, be applicable to all ELAP labs. So the focus be for all ELAP labs so we don't do any work for a dual system. For the parties that made the motion in the amendment, a motion in the second, are you willing to amend your motion? Yes, actually, I, that was uh, a given for me. So that's David saying to that's amend Ron, the Ron, Ron. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Ron. That's Ron saying to amend the motion to be uh, compliant, to allow comp uh, for application to all laboratories. We, do you support that in your second? Yes, I support that. Okay, got that done. Okay, now we need to do a formal vote and Jacob is going to need to get the vote up here in Northern California. 
So we're first... that, can I get a question in here oh, first? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I am. I need to stop looking at the clock. Is there any discussion? Yeah. Any discussion? Well, uh, David here. Um, if ELAP's going to continue with their schedule to release draft regulations by spring, this committee is not going to be able to complete its task in that time. That's a couple of months. Is, so should we ask for a postponement of that? Because otherwise, I mean, what would be the point? If they're still going to go ahead and write a set of regulations, submit it to the board and to the Office of Administrative Law. I propose we take the vote on the subcommittee and then determine whether or not we need an extension. If the subcommittee voted down, we don't need an extension. Well, actually, I was just asking a question. I wasn't even making a motion. No, I just think. Yeah. Be the way I would proceed. Okay, so th this is part of the discussion. Um, the parties that made the motion in the second would have to be willing to amend to include that. And any further discussion in Southern California? No. Northern California, Andy? I mean, it seems to me that if we go down this road, and, and I think David pointed it out, then we end up kicking the can down the road a whole lot longer and if we're going to move forward with some kind of a subcommittee I'd suggest that it just be incorporated into comments that are submitted on the proposed regs and we don't do anything to slow down the process of actually getting something on the table with the regs. Further discussion up here? Bruce? Uh, perhaps <clears throat> either Jacob or <clears throat> the council could let us know if that fits in terms of if a subgroup uh, or subcommittee you know, does come up with changes, recommendations that logically fit within where they can, during the comment period for proposed regs, say, hey, we believe this should be you know, taken out, this should be put in, this language should be changed as, a, as comments on the draft regulations. Is that, is that part of the process or fit within the process? Maybe if I can streamline that. The question is, what is your timeline for comments on the rigs? I think the indication from Christine earlier was they would be released next week. Correct. That the, the plan right now is to release next week. Again, a third preliminary draft um, that would be followed by a comment period. We had proposed 30 days. Um, initial, you know, back when we last met, um, a few people had suggested 45 days because of the um, the holiday period. Um, we're still um, working through and figuring out what is is acceptable, and we will also um, hold again a workshop for these third preliminary draft regulations. Okay, now you've now you've got your. Nope. But then, yes, I mean, I think to answer your question, during the APA process, so when we put out the, the, the regs in the package with the economic analysis, there'll be a comment period, and it sounds like it, that may be an appropriate time period to fold into, um, you know, the proposal, um, any changes that have been developed and, and um, you know, the, those could be um, presented during that comment period. Right, all comments would be considered. And a, a work group can submit comments. Individuals can submit comments. Okay, any, Christine? Okay, so it sounds like you all are looking at developing some sort of subcommittee. I have to interject. There's only been a motion and a second. There's okay. been no vote. If there was, okay. um, remember, it would have to be near unanimous or consensus that this dual, this single track that includes TNI that may have modifications that entire lab community here in LTAC supports so that we could take it to the agency partners and say this is what they want. Then you could get the support of ELAP. We're still moving on our path. Um, the board members wanted a package in front of them in the spring. So if you guys can hurry it up and get it done and agree, then we will support it. But if those elements are not met, then we can't support it, and that would be something that we would take to the board, which is our current 
preliminary draft. So that presupposes a second full LTAC meeting to review the proposals out of the consent committee and then have a near majority or near consensus vote. Uh, this is Stephen. I think that's correct and because uh, a work group, although could submit public comment, uh, would not have the vote of LTAC at that point. It is just simply a work product of a work group. And so we would need to uh, consider having a meeting earlier than March. Uh, we don't have scripted meeting dates, except for the last one is supposed to be around October of each year, minimum of three meetings per year. So uh, I think we're putting a little bit the cart before the horse here because we have to, one, determine how this vote goes. Uh, and then two, from that determination, we may need to have a little bit of dialogue about uh, as it, in reviewing action items is one of the last tasks for today. <coughs> and some of those action items may be activities we would need to have as an entire committee to address any specific timelines that might be an outcome of, of how this vote might pan out. Okay, so any other comments? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and put it to a vote. So what I'm going to do is um, go with those that are in favor and we'll need them identified, but actually Jacob, you're gonna go, you're gonna ask them by name from the checklist, right? So if you open up your, uh, your notes and just maybe to the to the right of that put a column for a, a work group formation so you can get affirmative negative and abstention maybe apply a plus minus and zero I'm helping Jacob since it's normally Kate that does this all right so go ahead Jacob okay Diane Anderson Mindy Bowie yes. Jill Bro yes. Gail Cho Sorry. Yeah, the extra, yeah. Yes, sir. No, no, sorry. Right. Stephen Clark? Yes. Ron Koss? Yes. Who do? do? Yes. Andy Eden? No. Miriam Gabor? Abstain. Anthony Gonzalez? Yes. Rich Gossett? Yes. David Kimbrough? Yes. Mark Kokomore? Yes. Allison McKenzie? No. And that's it. Did that cover everybody? Did anybody not get an opportunity to vote? Stephen, this is Brad. Do I get to vote for Yes, Brad. I, I knew somebody was missing and I was blanking and going through my head. I wasn't going through the checklist. Brad, you are an official proxy for Bruce because per our bylaws, our updated bylaws, if notified within 48 hours, I think it is, then a proxy may vote on behalf of an LTAC member. So, Brad, you do have a vote. Oh, okay then. So it, would be, it would go under Bruce's. Bruce, uh, okay, Bruce Godby, proxy Brad Meadows? Uh, no. Okay, I believe that's a majority. It's something like 10 to 4 or 9 to 5. 9, 4, 4, and 1 abstention. So 9, 4 to 1. So the motion carries. So when we form a, so basically the motion is simply to form a work group for discussion within the context that one discusses this option of a modified. Um, uh, laboratory standard that would be considered in a timely basis, discussed in a timely basis for consideration for all labs. Okay, so that was what was um, the vote carried. So now we need to have uh, LTAC members that want to participate. All right, this is where I'm 99% I'm sure we cannot have, since we have 14 voting members, if I'm correct, we have to have less than a majority participating in a, because otherwise we're holding a, 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 an LTAC meeting. So it has to be six, no more than six. That's what I believe we had previously heard. Yeah, there's 13 voting members. So maybe uh, there's probably going to be more than six that want to participate. So for, for those of you that might come from similar uh, representation sectors, um, you, you know, you can't have more than six. And we had nine affirmative. So, uh, I don't even know how to go about trying to whittle this down. Uh, I'll start in Northern California and maybe 
parties in Southern California can come over the top and say, so-and-so, would you mind not so I can, because I don't know how else to handle that. Uh, so in Northern California, by a raise of hands for Jacob to put the, put a hand up, not for Jacob, for us to put a hand up and Jacob to tally it, uh, or identify who the parties are, who wants to participate in the work group in Northern California? Nobody. Well, it might not be hard at all. <laughs> so, well, it's for nothing. So, so <laughs> we may even be at two or less and not have to comply with Bagley King. So Mindy was an affirmative. Anybody else? This can be state agency partners as well, because this is not a situation where you're voting. So state agency partners can participate as well. So Mindy's a yes. Can ELAP have a member? ELAP has to have a they staff have member. Have a member. And members of the public can also. Members of the public can participate as well. So I'll get there. So anybody else in Northern California? I will participate. Okay, so Jill, Mindy. Anybody in Southern California? Ron. Hui. Uh, Ron and Hui. Okay, so that's four. We definitely need input from legal counsel um, because our meetings in the past, we haven't had to webinar them or anything like that. They've held a conference call meeting and worked it out for Northern and Southern California. So we got four participants. Um, Christine, will you be able to assign an, an ELAP staff member to be present or quote unquote participate via telephone? Okay, Christine, that's an affirmative. Gail? Okay, you need to Mike? This is Gail. Um, my participation was contingent upon me asking my boss first. Okay. So that would be potentially five. Allison, were you hitting the mic or no? Okay. <laughs> She's done. All right. So um, the what will need to happen is we how, how soon can we get feedback so we're operating appropriately? I can provide something next week early. In the okay. Week. Early next week. We'll have feedback as to whether we need to publicly notice these. Uh, Mindy. I just have a question. How do we go about soliciting members of the public as we have some of the authors of the current proposal today that wanted this? I mean, do we open it to just them, to other people? How do we do this? As I understand, these are open to the public. We don't get to, as I understand, get to pick and choose who the members of the public are that participate. So I would expect Amber... Uh, at all. Um, yeah. So Amber's indicated they have a subgroup that would be interested and it, there's no prohibition either from other members of the public coming. Um, there needs to be some type of either communication back and or work product uh, for us. So um, the reality is, I'm just going to take a few moments here, it's very unlikely you're going to meet before the end of the year. Um, we've got timelines of regs that are coming up. So it's really in your court to determine what you can do as members on a what timeline, of, of work group members on a what timeline, to have the dialogue, to comply with whatever communication we get from Bagley Keene. And um, I'm not going to go ahead now on action items and start soliciting a timeline for a potential earlier LTAC meeting than March. Um, but be prepared. You may need to expect to receive a communication from Christine based upon the activities of the work group that we may need to have a relatively short notice for us normally. We'd like to get it months out. LTAC meeting if there needs to be discussion in the vote of LTAC to help address Christine's desire to determine if we can get consensus on a particular item. So before we close, Diane raised her hand. And if we don't come up with the consensus, what happens at that point? So what I understand is, is if there's a majority vote of LTAC, Christine needs to respond to us uh, as the DELAPO. Uh, the response is within 30 days. Uh, what she would pr presumably do is, as she did last time, take the information to her other uh, contributing parties, which would be the state agency partners. LTAC decided on this type of vote. It has to be majority, right, to at least move the subject matter forward. Um, then she'd go to the state agency partners, get their feedback, and respond back to us within 30 days. Uh, and she may also go to the external advisory committee and have discussions within her agency and with her management. So that's the process that, that would occur after that. Um, and then the work group should also be prepared that depending upon the timelines for the response on the regs, that you may need to have some type of 
deliverable internally for your group. You don't have to get LTAC approval because you guys can submit something <coughs> without our approval, not voting on it, that would go as part of the regs, uh, part of the public comment on the regs. You're just like an individual or multiple individuals. And, but that would not come with a full vote from LTAC if we don't have that vote beforehand. Is everybody clear on that? Okay, uh, Mindy. Just one question for Jacob and Christine. So you're planning on releasing the draft regs next week. <coughs> When do you have a date set for this public workshop? Because I know that was supposed to be very close to the same time those were released. Correct? Uh, I could say in January. Okay. Yeah. Within the 30 day comment period, or will it be? Yes, after? within. Okay. So, first couple of weeks of January. Okay. Any uh, other comments from Southern California? No, we're good. Thank you, Northern California. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Anthony's a motion. Diane's, a, Diane's second. All in favor? I'm not giving discussion. All in favor? <laughs> All, right. All right, we're done. Thank you, everybody.